You're broadcasting. Good evening. Uh, my name is Anne Moriarty. I'm the vice chair of the City of Panola Planning Commission, and I'd like to welcome you to our regular meeting of the City of Panola Planning Commission on November 8th, 2021. Uh, we are awaiting Tim Bonuelos, the chair, but we will get started as is. Uh, due to the state of California's declaration of emergency, this meeting is being held virtually pursuant to authorization from Governor Newsom's executive orders, city council and commission meetings are not currently open to in-person attendance. There are several ways to watch this meeting. You can watch it live on channel 26. You can watch it video streamed live on the city's website. And if none of these options are available or if you need assistance with public comment, please contact planning manager, David Hannum at 510-724-8912 or dhanham at ci.panol.ca.us. Before we go through how you can participate in the public comment, um, I'd like to call this meeting to order. And could we do the Pledge of Allegiance and then roll call, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, under God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For all. That's for all. I think we should pre-record that and have it kind of <laughs> synchronized like I see all these courses. <laughs> Okay. You don't like the original us originality. Sure <laughs> <laughs> if we can have tenor, bass, soprano, and alto, I think we can. All right. <laughs> um, Mr. Hannum, can we have roll call, please? Sure. Commissioner Menes? Present. Commissioner Martinez? Here. Commissioner Benzuli? Here. Commissioner Wong? Here. Yeah. Commissioner Kern? Here. Vice Chair Moriarty? Present. And Chair Van Wales is absent as of now. We do have a, we do have six members. We do have a quorum, so we can take action on all, any of the items that needed tonight. There, or or Vice Chair Moore, really just a point of clarification. There is a, a typo in the agenda, or I guess it's slightly more than a typo, but uh, the Planning Commission is meeting remotely, actually not in accordance with. Uh, any executive orders from the governor, but in accordance with AB 361 and a um, resolution adopted by the city council authorizing um, remote meetings for all of the city's uh, legislative bodies. So sure. no, no need to change anything. I just want to clarify that for the record. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Mong. Um, um. Before we continue, I'd like to briefly apologize for my absence at the prior meeting. It was unintended, but that's no excuse. I should have been there. I wasn't there, and as a result, the meeting didn't happen. I apologize. It won't happen again. Thank you, Commissioner Thank you. Okay. Um, before we go to citizens to be heard, uh, I'd like to know. I'd like you to know that members of the public may submit a live remote public comment via Zoom video conferencing. You can download the Zoom mobile app from the Apple App Store or Google Play. If you're using a desktop computer, you can test your connection to Zoom. Um, and it also allows you to join the meeting by, by phone. We do have um, comments to the planning manager, David Hannum at dhanham at ci.panol.ca.us. And comments received before the close of the item will be read into the record. And you can use the raise hand feature if connected via Zoom. Please wait to be called upon. And then if you're on the phone, you can press star nine, then star six, to unmute. So that's star nine and then star six. Um, all right, question. Do we need to read the Americans with Disabilities Act? 
You, you do not. Okay. Vice Chair Moriarty, I do see a hand raised. Um, this yes. is from caller five seven, uh, so number ending in five seven four eight. Um, you would be allowed to speak right now. Um, please press star six to unmute yourself. Um, you may speak now. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? All right. Um, I'm calling on behalf of uh, our fellow uh, citizens and and uh, friends and re longtime residents of Penal. Uh, and I hate to be uh, a herd of uh, dead horses here, but we have uh, several ongoing questions, issues and problems that I think uh, we've addressed to both the City Council and the Planning Commission before, and uh, we, we either uh, can't get a straight answer or nothing has been uh, done to remediate these uh, ongoing issues, you know, and, and uh, we voted those people in in the City Council, and I know you people are, are, are more or less uh, appointed but uh we've been a long time taxpayers long time residents of Panola, and we continue our voices and our, our concerns uh to make you know Panola a better place to go unrecognized um first item is the uh major breach on the uh, back end of the sprout shopping center between the the uh, parking lot and the uh, bowling alley center hill on the creek side there on the east side of the creek it's the northeast side of the creek it's gotten worse i'll have you know over the last several big rains and we let you people know about it and you said you would look into it you would call the uh the people that were responsible with the county and uh we need to work together on this you know with the city of Pano. we can't wait till the whole hillside and have the shopping center right away the parking lot goes sliding down the hill uh to, to affect our quality of life if not some health health uh, and safety issues for the general public there because there are trails and sidewalks on either side of that creek they took the tarp off it and now there's more uh breaching going on uh you know the size of two two or three giant mac trucks from the bottom of the creek to the top of the the, the grade there also in that starbucks i mean in the uh, shopping center area it's about the uh, landscaping and the trees are still uh, an issue where they haven't been uh, completed there. And I don't know what's going on with the uh, property owners or, or whoever that you were supposed to contact and work with to get that done. So there's big gapping holes on the sides of the parking lot that can also be a health and safety issue for people falling in the side of the uh, parking lot and some of those uh, curb abutments are sticking out all over the place there and they're not painted yellow or red to let the people know or uh, that you know they might roll over into the ditch there on the side of the parking lot and the other third item is the um, uh, the uh, situation at the Starbucks Kaiser and the Vita ingress and out, out regress uh, islands on the front of Buffalo uh, Valley Road going into the driveways there and I think one Starbucks has now violated the city code by putting up a flag banner on one of those uh, uh, islands going in between their building and the Davida building. And there's a big yellow orange cone there now too because the city and the planning department allowed that to go on without proper signage being installed there or landscaping to make it, to let people know that they're, they're not you know that there's a big curb and a, a, and a, a diamond there to go in and out on both sides of the driveways going into Kaiser and the Tapita building and there's no proper signage there with arrows and two-way street arrows and and what have you and it's very dangerous for people crossing the street and the sidewalk there with people speeding on and off the on-ramp and off-ramp of the freeway um, the other thing is the uh, metering light signs are all ongoing eastbound 
down by Jack in the Box going up the freeway, but if someone took out the lights there and there are no metering lights on the top of the hill. So did we approve that the metering light system wasn't working and why are half of the metering lights working and on, but uh, the one over there next to the road Jack in the Box is not on anymore. And then also, can we get an update on the uh, Safeway new shopping center or the old Safeway shopping center and uh, doc, the old Dr. Hospital property because that wasn't uh, discussed or brought up in the last two meetings and why the lights are off in the Safeway parking lot at night half of the time or all the time and it's a safety issue there and then the three telephone poles on Pomo Valley and Granada on the corner that are band-aid band-aided together with PG&E working there and I think they're done but there's three telephone poles that are still there with orange cones around them on the corner opposite the Coldwell Banker building there on Cano Valley Road and Granada Court. And uh, I think somebody from the city ought to go out there and either work with PG&E to get that right or someone, and, and they're blocking a, uh, a uh, sidewalk for the um, uh, handicapped people. So it's a violation of the uh, uh, 88 eight code, or what do you call the, the code for the dis disabled disability code? Because they've got it locked up with three telephone poles and two orange cones there, right there on the corner. And it's been like that for the last two to three years. And I, I don't know who's dragging their feet on trying to uh, consolidate one telephone pole into, I mean, three into one there. But um, if you can give us an answer, uh, by the end of the meeting or when you have your uh, committee reports, uh, we'd appreciate it or else actually start working on some of these things rather than just talk about them. Thank you. Thank you for your call. Um, we'll have the update on the Safeway and the, um, the property on Appiumay at the end of the meeting. So we will update that. Um, Mr. Hannum, are there any other of these that we can address at the moment? Uh, no, I had a comment from uh, Irma Rupert about, but she hasn't called in, and I don't see another. Um... It looked like um, her hand was raised, but it just went down. It, or, no, it, it's up again. Or, or her or, or um, David Rupert's hand was up in the attendees. Yeah. Okay, and uh, I don't know if you, I think we can let him in. I don't know if Justin can let him in, or I don't see his hand, so I don't care. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would just like to make a quick comment that the meeting lights on the uh, freeway on ramp, but if, uh, I'm sure that would be a CHP issue. It's a Caltrans issue. Okay. Caltrans issue, right. Um, and I know that there has been uh, quite a bit of work being done on the Starbucks Kaiser Ingress. Um, but just just so the gentleman caller understands that we cannot, we may discuss the matter, but we cannot take any action on any of the things that you have brought up at this point. Um, however, um, Mr. Hannum, are there any others of these, these that we can address at the moment? The breach uh, on the creek behind Sprouts, um, the parking lots, that there are no curb abutments, and then the Starbucks and Kaiser ingress with the flag banner there, which is against code. Well, we can take a look at, yeah, they don't have a temporary sign permit, so we'll take a look, we'll take a look at the sign thing tomorrow, uh, see, where, see where it's at, and attach okay. it there. Regarding, regarding the flood control channels, those are all uh, West, West Contra Costa flood, flood, uh, flood protection district channels. So we'll have to take a look, ask them and see where there's at. Our right of way really is at uh, top of the bank. So any any erosion from the actual creek or within the creek up to that point is is uh, the responsibility of Western Contra Costa Flood Protection, Contra Costa County Flood Protection Control District. So we can get in contact with them on that. Uh, the media analyze that's a Caltrans issue. Um, regarding the, I wasn't sure on the one on the, on the one creek side on the Devita side. Um, we'll have to take a look at that and see where where their the degradation is, and take a look at and see what we if if it's a property owner responsibility or if it's a if it's a flood protection control responsibility. Okay. I answered those are the four questions I had. 
And then um, there were the lights on Pinal Valley Road and in the, the Safeway parking lot, that, that's the, the private company there. Um, but the lights off of Pinal Valley Road and the- um, Yeah, I'll, I'll check with Public Works on that to see where they're at. That's, that's probably Public Works' uh, department. So we'll, I'll check with Public Works and see where that's at and, and see where they are in, the, in the getting, that, getting that fixed. Okay, and um, how can the gentleman get an update on that? On the uh, list? If you can send me his email, I'd be glad to send him an email to let him know answers to the four, to the four questions uh, by writing. And so if you can do that, and my email is all over the, all over the first couple pages of the, uh, of the agenda, which is dhanham, H-A-N-H-A-M, at ci.tanol.ca.us, and I'll be happy to reply to that email. Uh, David, could we maybe, uh, I don't know how the rest of the uh, commission feels, but uh, perhaps at our next meeting, could there maybe be an agenda item to address all of these issues, what the updates are? Well, what I can do is I can put them in, I can put them in the communications section and let you know where they're, you know, what, what, was, what was said and all that kind of stuff. Okay, that'd be good. Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you to the caller. Um, do we have any other calls? Um, yes. Um, so we do have a hand raised from David and Irma Rupert. Okay. Um, and um, David and Irma, um, you're allowed to speak right now. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. I hope I'm not too loud. Uh, good evening, commissioners, uh, Mr. Hanham, and uh, public uh, and attorney. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm here for uh, a reason that's very important to all of us. Um, and I reported this to the council several times. Measure X, the half cent sales tax that was approved by the county voters in 2020. Uh, what happened is they set up a, a group together, uh, a committee to figure out what to do with these monies. I read an article and it's all over in the city council notes, citizens to be heard, uh, October 19th. And what was really uh, concerning to me was on the article, there's a fifth goal that said, welcome and safe community, which will fund the reopening of closed East County fire stations. Well, I was very concerned because West County was forgotten. It was eliminated. Uh, I don't know who. I know that sometimes you can't believe everything you read, but however, uh, West was not included. I came to the council October 19th, addressed this issue. It's all it's it's on the uh, uh, um, the notes. However, what they decided to do was put it on the agenda November 2nd to bring it up to uh, as a report uh, by the chief and the city manager. What happened November 2nd? Uh, we were waiting for that council meeting. In the interim, what I did was contact Supervisor Joya and Supervisor Glover. Uh, as to where their status was with these monies and was fire station 74 in the West County included and why were we eliminated? Well, uh, Supervisor Glover answered with a representative but didn't send any comments. Uh, it didn't bother me because uh, Supervisor Joya who represents the Pinole Valley where the fire station is did contact me and he said, I'd like to come and speak at the council. So November 2nd, he showed up unexpectedly that evening to report back to us where he was, the status, and what they were gonna do about it. The meeting for the next uh, uh, um, uh, county will be November 16th. They will take a vote on it. And I just wanna let you know that he did clarify everything uh, November 2nd meeting as to why uh, we were not included, uh, why we were excluded, and all this other stuff. But to be honest with you, uh, whatever happened, happened. Uh, Supervisor Joya was very gracious coming in at the last minute. However, if you can bear me some time, I'd like to read his uh, response to me. You have okay. time. Good. Two minutes. Ms. Rupert? Yes, ma'am. Uh, do you have, you were going to read his his response to you? Yeah, I'm, I'm reading it right now. Yeah. 
Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, it says, um, I will probably, it says, I likely will represent then ultimately after the redistricting that takes place later this year. I am one of the strong advocates to develop and pass Measure X. One of the main purposes of this X revenue is to support needed improvement in fire services in different parts of the county, including in Pinole. Measure X advisory committee made recommendations to the Board of Supervisors on how to use these funds. One of the recommendations did involve reopening some fire stations in the east and he also said West County. The county administrator's office is preparing a report to the Board of Supervisors on this based on the advisory committee recommendations that will include funding to reopen the Pinole Valley Fire, Fire Station. That will come to our board on November 16th. You are welcome to testify or write a letter, email in favor of that. I am planning to support expenditure of Measure X funding to reopen Fire Station 74. I am hopeful that the proposal will pass. Thank you for supporting Measure X and advocating for the Pinot Fire Station. So in short of it, uh, commissioners, I am advocating for all of us. And thank you to Rafael Menes, our uh, commissioner. He put uh, a next door, uh, I'm not good at petition to go door to door. He put a, a next door, uh, a petition and put some information there. We like everybody as many people to sign the petition email like you said email and contact all the supervisor before november 16th pledging our support there's a letter there that the consul all, all sent to um, the county supervisors I, I'm, I'm not sure about the date june or july and it's in there please i urge and encourage all of us not to let them forget west county does exist we're still alive and well, and we'd like to support a fire station 74. And I would appreciate it. We call all tell our friends. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you for allowing me to speak. And thank you, Rafael. Great. Thank you very much, Ms. Rupert. Um, do we have any other citizens to be heard? Um, no, Vice Chair. That's all I see right now. Yeah, and I don't, I don't have anything either. Great, double check, 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 double check. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, then is that um, Ms. Whalen? Are you, did you have a comment? Good or evening, evening, commissioners. I, I just wanted to take a moment to introduce myself here. I'm uh, Lily Whalen, I'm your new community development director, and I'm very, very pleased to be working with and uh, for citizens of Pinole, um, my local community. So happy to be here. I know you have a, um, some meeting items on your agenda, so I won't take any more of your time. Well, it's lovely to have you here. Thank you so much, Ms. Whalen, for joining us. Um, we'll look forward to meeting you. Um, uh, Mr. Hannum, do we have uh, a time in the near future that we'll spend a little bit more time with Ms. Whalen and hear more of um, her background and what she's bringing to this position. Oh yeah, I've got a full. She doesn't know it yet, but I've got a full. Uh, uh, I've got a full profile ready to go for the for our, for our next meeting. I wasn't sure which meeting she was going to come into, so I'll, I'll make sure we have uh, we have that ready to go for the next meeting. <laughs> Lovely, perfect. Thank you so much for introducing yourself. It's nice to meet you. Great. Okay, then um, that said, I believe that um, after the citizens to be heard, if there's no one else, that we can go on to the approval of the draft minutes from September 27th, 2021. If I may, uh, Vice Chair, I had a few brief comments as a private citizen. Please. So first off, I don't know if we have a slide for this meeting like we that like there often is for the council meeting, but for people who want to join the meeting, the webinar ID is 876-3714-9010. And you can also join by phone at 1-669-900-6833. 
Secondly, I was wondering if it would be possible for us to add a land acknowledgement to the start of our meetings as is done at the city council meetings since they adopted that. I don't know whether that would require a separate resolution by the council or whether the planning commission can adopt it on its own, but I figured this would be the appropriate point during the meeting to bring that topic up. Um, um, thank you. That, uh, Commissioner Menace, if you would bring that up again during um, perhaps item H, um, City planners and, and commissioners reports. At the end of the meeting. At the end of the meeting. Aha, uh -huh. I know H. Yes, I'll do that. Great. We'll make it make sure that that gets addressed so we can discuss that. Thank you. Anything else, Commissioner Menes? So I just had a couple of brief comments that I felt would be of use. Great, thank you. So, um, do we have any issues with the meeting minutes from September 27th? Um, I, would, I would like to uh, make a motion to approve the minutes of uh, September 27th. Can we have a second that? Second. Okay, then let's have a vote on that. I believe we need to have a roll call vote, Mr. Hannum. Yep. Uh, Commissioner Menes? Yes. Commissioner Martinez? Yes. Commissioner Benzuli? Yes. Commissioner Wong? Yes. Commissioner Curran? Yes. Vice Chair Moriarty? Yes. Motion carries 6 0. Okay, the meeting minutes have passed, and now we will go on to our public hearings. Um, let's see, do I need to read through the instructions for public hearings? Uh, we don't We don't have any tonight, so we can just go, we can go past that one. We can just go straight. We can just go straight to um, new business, no old business. Go straight to new business, which is the three corridors specific plan, the San Pablo Avenue corridor information and discussion. Mr. Hannum will present an informational and discussional item reviewing the content of the city's adopted three corridor specific plan with a focus on the San Pablo Avenue corridor. Take it away, Mr. Hannum. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Moriarty. Uh, Dave, do you have the PowerPoint from a uh, last meeting? If you could put that up for me, that'd be great. Um, so I'll just go ahead and get started. As, as commissioners are aware, as part of our background, you know, the city of council adopted the three quarter specific plan in 2010. And over the last 11 years, the city's been governing San Pablo Avenue, Pinole Valley Road, and Aping Way using the design guidelines and land use standards that are within, within those areas. I also put a link to the specific plan. So if there are people that want to take a look at the specific plan, um, we can, uh, where would we go? Um, so uh, you, can, you can find it on our website. Uh, over the course of the last six months, the city has received, um, again, five multifamily projects, totaling approximately 600 units over the three corridors. We've got two on San Pablo, one on Beeping Way, and one on Pinot Valley Road. And, and so as, as our last meeting, as I say, like over the next few meetings, we'll be talking about the specific plan and the individual corridors. And tonight we'll be talking about San Pablo Avenue. I did include, you know, again, some of the brief descriptions of the other three. But, uh, but we'll go straight to the analysis. Thanks, Dave. If you go to the, there we go. Oh, all right, there we go. So there we go. That's uh, the San Pablo, the Pinole Valley Road, and the uh, APA Way corridors. If you go to the next slide, please. There we go. All right, so there they are, the three corridors. Uh, Pinole Valley, San Pablo, APA Way. So if we go to the next one. Okay, so basically the vision for San Pablo. So to kind of give you just a little bit, and, I'll, and I just want to stop kind of right there. As part of the tonight's tonight's meeting, we'll be looking at the San Pablo corridor, the three corridor specific outlines, the vision, the economic development strategy, circulation, private and public realm standard design guidelines that we use throughout the plan. Uh, also the land, land use and development standards and infrastructure. So in terms of our vision, I mean, these are the visions that were outlined in the specific plan. Uh, but basically, I'm not going to go through them all because they're all up there. I'll just go through a, a couple, which is really Old Town, 
uh, which is in this, most of it is in the San Pablo Avenue, or, or I would say the commercial, more of the commercial strips are within the San Pablo Avenue corridor. And it has a strong sense of place as our city's cultural, civic, and, and uh, historic core. Um, it, it also it also could transition from a small scale network, especially retail and services, to a mixed use district with diverse residential and employment opportunities to local and regional services. As you know, we've got a number, of, we've got a couple of, of uh, what we call core core businesses, like with Antlers and with uh, Tina's and Bear Claw Bakery, and, and on the other side of the street, we've got you know uh, East Bay Coffee. We've got some of those professional commercial offices, and of course, the City of Pinole Bank uh to kind of anchor anchor our downtown towards as we go i guess west towards on san pablo uh we've got more of our commercial our commercial projects a, little, a couple little strip centers and of course those two major um uh those two new uh, residential projects but our vision for but back to in terms of this vision for san pablo we want some high quality streetscape improvements and currently identify walkways uh, could be used to identify Old Town special as a special designation, rather than a bypass to the next jurisdiction. And so that's that's more of our wayfinding, more of a bringing a bringing a specific. Uh, and I mean, and a lot of cities will do different street signs to augment, you know, uh, the downtown uh, lighting, the way the lighting is done, um, landscaping along the area. So just another. Those are some of the high quality streetscape improvements, whether they have parklets or more outside dining in front of the businesses. Um, and so that way, when you drive through there, you, you have a little, oh, we're in the Pinal Old Town. And so um, a lot of communities in the past have upgraded their downtown to be able to do some of those things. And I think we're, we're getting in that position to where we just take a look at how we can position ourselves to be able to do that. But also, San Pablo also provides a vital economic development opportunities uh, that can support diverse uses that serve the needs for local residents and visitors. Of course, we have our as as you go as I say as you go west towards down down, down San Pablo, we have more of our commercial office needs down there. We've got sugar, we've got some industrial uses as we get as we go farther along San Pablo. So San Pablo has a really a real mix. It's probably the the one corridor that has all of the different terms of residential, commercial, industrial uses, and of course that's. I think San Pablo has been around for a long, long time and, and been used as a highway. And so, uh, and so those use, those diverse uses have been able to grow over the course of the years. And now we're probably seeing an, uh, like maybe a renaissance of San Pablo in certain areas uh, in town. And that's something that we need to take a look at. The city also sees San Pablo as that, that it provides our opportunity to enhance streets and sidewalks, connect with San Pablo Bay, public transit, surrounding neighborhoods and San Pablo connects us to Hercules, connects us to San Pablo uh, uh, and uh, in Richmond. So it, um, so it, it's our regional road. And I think there are ways that we can take a look at San Pablo and develop different criteria uh, and get our bicycle lanes and kind of kind of look at San Pablo as, so, that, so that when you come into Pinole, you know you're on Pinole's part of San Pablo. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the goal is to make San Pablo look like what the city of Pinal vision is for that. That we maintain some landscaping. We do have some landscape mediums that we can use, but also projects that are coming in are also including new landscaping. So we're adding more greenery. Saha's got adding more landscaping in their project. Mr. Woods is adding more landscaping to their project. Um, as East Bay Coffee goes, they'll be adding some landscaping uh, to their outdoor dining area. So uh, along the sides so again just to kind of kind of change that more concrete industrial commercial use into a, a softer a soft use using the landscaping to be able to to do that um san pablo avenue can support several pedestrian nodes where visitors can once walk to several destinations and so that's something that we need to take a look at and a lot of those pedestrian nodes are what you'll know is full bounce uh, kind of shorten the crosswalk in certain areas, kind of, again, another trap. It's more of a traffic calming uh, to let people know there are pedestrians in the area and it's just safer or safer for people to walk. So to outline those types of things. Um, that San Paulo Avenue should include gateway entry statements in, into both into both the city and to Old Town. Uh, so because as we come in from Hercules, right in, you're right into downtown Old Town. And as you're coming in from the east or west going east, takes a little while to get to there is some uh 
there is some wayfinding or signage, different signage once you get to the old town, but it's something that we can update uh, and go through and, and maybe add, add some different things there. Um, of course, development standards to support pedestrian scale buildings, coordinating with street furnishings and enhanced landscaping. So again, we're trying to do that with some of the newer projects that do have either a patio or like with the Sawhouse project, they have more of a commercial front, but they do have a landscaping in front. Um, and uh, as well as Pro Vista, and they've kind of got like a little plaza, I wouldn't say a plaza, but a little area where they can sit within the front of their project. I mean, it's more towards a residence, but it just lends itself to that uh, new new look. And basically, again, streetscape improvements should incorporate gateway features that let's travel with that if they're entering an old, an, old, an old town. So those are things that, in terms of the vision, this is what was captured in 2010, something we can build upon, uh, you know, with our commission and, and, and move forward. Go to the next slide, Dave. Okay, so in terms of, I'm kind of going to give you some, before I start on this of urban design, I'll kind of give you some, some physical, some physical things about uh, downtown or the San Pablo area. San Pablo area, basically covers approximately 144 acres from the western edge of San Pablo and Del Monte to the intersection of John Street and, Pablo, and San Pablo Avenue. Um, it's uh, development projections um, based on from the general plan and from the specific plan and I'll, and I'll just use the proposed numbers. Uh, they're looking at approximately San Pablo is looked to have 1119 residential units you know, 522,000 square feet of commercial retail commercial, uh, 300 feet, 300 square feet of office, and 472,000 square feet of industrial. Those are all up, except for professional office. Professional office is seen to be down in that area, down about 29,000 square feet, based on the land uses that are that are proposed or that have been approved for that for that area. Um, and I think and that's because again, when you look at the urban design, the circulation principles are looking to add more additional restaurants, live work type environments, um, you know, office employment with retail restaurant, entertainment uses, uh, to enhance some of the pedestrian crossings to improve the walkability. Again, we talk about auto circulation and reduce congestion um, at, at the crossings. Uh, so we want to improve public transportation connections to BART and also maximize safety through shelter, lighting, and signage and visibility. With that's like with one project with Pinal Vista, they're creating a brand new bus stop, shelter, uh, lighting for that for that area. So that'll be a nice improvement. And of course, enhance the connections between the neighborhoods, the bay, and other recreational opportunities. We have a great trail. We just have to find a way how to, I mean, people kind of know where it is, but I think we need to really build on that from, if you're at the corner of San Pablo and Tenet, or, you know, how do you get to the bay? And can you bike to the bay? Can you walk to the bay? Is there a safe pedestrian path? And there is one path, I think, on the backside of uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Bear Claw. There's a little path through there uh, over in that area. There's a path that you can get through, but I, I think it just goes to Fernandez Park. I don't know if it goes all the way to the bay. Um, so that's something there, be able to create a path to the bay from, um, from downtown. I think that would be a, that'd be a good thing. And that would help create some recreational opportunities as well. As well. Okay, Dave, you can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so part of the parking and focal point. Um, for, for San Pablo. Again, mo as you can see, all most of the parking, the focal points, the logistics, the principles, the signage, are all trying to encourage that, re that additional retail, to encourage on-street parking and support additional parking and gar uh, parking garage, which you know that that, that would help out in some areas. Um, streetscapes and landscapes, again, improvement, green spaces, public art. And these are some of the focal points and aesthetic and lighting principles for San Pablo Avenue that. Uh, that is part of the specific plan that we'd be taking a look at trying to do with different different projects. Uh, and again, like I talked about earlier, the establishing a consistency in the street lighting and street gate furnishings and kind of create those areas throughout San Pablo that would that would encourage um, that would encourage uh, increased length, increased density of development and increased new development, um, those types of things. So uh, Again, more of a coordination of, of different ideas. Go to the next page, Dave. Okay, then we'll get to the, some of the units. That's the table I was kind of talking about of where we're at. 
in terms of existing. The existing was in 2010. Uh, that was the existing uh, residential uses, the retail, the offices. And by, uh, by using the commercial mixed use, the residential mixed use, uh, all of the mixed use zoning that's along it, this is what kind of it creates in terms of the proposed, the 1,119 units, the 552,927 square feet of retail, the office is a little bit is a little bit um, a little bit lower, and the industrial is a little bit higher. So again, a lot of the mixed uses are being able to generate higher number or higher square footages, higher number of units, uh, because there are some parcels that are maybe underutilized. That if they utilize it as full as potential, that these are some of the things that we can do as part of that. You go to the next slide, David. Just kind of gives you the, you know, what this there in San Pablo uh, again, and these are some of the areas you have the mixed use area, which is pretty much the majority of San Pablo until you get to about I, my my vision's going to me, but it's about Pinole Square or Pinole, uh, Pinole Shores is where the, really the commercial mixed use, and then it splits up to more of the service sub area, which this is more of the industrial uses uh, in the purple. Um, and of course, Old Town in the brown, which is the core of the Old Town um, in that area. Okay, go to the next. Okay, so this is the zoning of the area. Um, I need to get this view, sorry. I, I got all your pictures right in front of the map. There we go. So we, so right there, you can kind of see how, how it's made up and where the commercial and residential mixed use is. As you can see, there's a, there's a broad, there's a there you know a broad sense of zoning and and so there are a lot of existing uses that are already in these areas so either some of them are le what we call legal non-conforming issues meaning that they wouldn't be able to go uh in this area however it just get, it also gives it also gives each property uh a type of mixed use to be able to create either a residential or commercial use both the rmu and the cmu both have, as you can see, have residential components um, for, for, for additional residential units. Um, the, of course, the very high density residential, which is, of course, the, where like Pinal Woods are, and I don't have an arrow, so I can't, I can't point, but you can see the light brown, uh, and then, of course, medium density, which are existing communities over uh, along, it uh, looks like that's, uh, I'll say that's Meadow. But it's close to that to that area. But there's also some mixed use development um, or medium density as you're going down. Um, it's a like tenant uh, as well. So and again, a PPI, um, which is City Hall, which is the City Hall complex. Uh, of course, there is some open space along along the backside, which is I think the creek. Uh, so again, it, it, San Pablo is probably, when you look at all the different corridors, probably has the most uh, different or the, the, the most differential, the most differential zonings that would allow for uh, multiple uses on these properties. So uh, if you go to the next slide, Dave. Okay. So, so this is one of those mixed use projects. So here we are at San Pablo Avenue. Uh, the Saha project, which is on Apian Way, which is 33 units on 25 acres. On this project, even though it was on a commercial mixed use, there was a, an amendment to the specific plan to allow for a property to go 100%, as long as it meant some community benefits, which it did. It, it's a senior, it's a more of a veterans affordable housing project, and so it kind of and, it, and we defined what those standards were. So. Again, kind of, it also gives you uh, a sense of what else is around it. So it kind of goes in with the area. We've got some resident, single family residential to the uh, little um, medium. This is where the medium density residential is on police uh, and then uh, on Meadow, another single family. And of course, across the street is some industrial and OP, the, uh, old, the OIMU, which is the office industrial misuse. So, okay, if we go to the next slide, Dave. And of course, the Vista Woods outlined, and that's kind of going to be the property of Vista Woods. And you can kind of again see some of the surrounding areas. We've got some, you know, we've got some hair salons, and we've got uh, a little strip center uh, just across the street from it. Uh, we've got the Treasure Hut. Um, we've got, you know, we've got some some residential uses, and they are, you know, within a walking distance. Uh, pretty good walking distance of some uh, 
commercial uh, restaurants uh, to both sides as they're going towards uh, towards the west, towards uh, where La, La Familia is, the tiny eatery, and um, that area. So this will be all developed. And so this is the 179 units on 2.01. This building, of course, will be de de demolished. All of this will be cleaned up on, in terms of the property. Um, and so we look forward to that development. Okay, if you go to the next slide, Dave. Okay, so on this, I wanted to include this, and so you kind of have an idea of what what's that, what we're talking about. In each of the general plan, in each of the specific plan areas, whether it's uh, San Pablo, Apian Way, um, or Pinot Valley Road, the specific the specific plan ident identified opportunity sites. And so being in San Pablo, I kind of broke it up into two things. These were the sites that were that were outlined as priority or pri uh, or opportunity sites, pri pri priority development areas. Uh, another another sample that you hear. And so it kind of gives you an idea of where some of these pro properties are and what was being looked at. And of course, property number three, I, I put them in the order. So on the bottom, it's three, four, five, uh, six, and seven. So as you can see, uh, three, that's more of the uh, uh, Vista Woods. And so uh, again, desire residential use, we've got some, and then the other sites are usually, uh, that'd be Pinole Shores, uh, which we have some uses there, looking at some green industries. Right now, I think there's some warehousing over there. Uh, and then of course some flex on item number four. Uh, again, looking at that's a green industry and retail. And so these are kind of the, the priority opportunity sites west of Apian Way. So this is this is San Pablo opportunity sites west of Apian Way. If you go to the next slide, Dave. And here are the two for the San Pablo east of Apian Way, which is one, of course, is that looks like right around the bank of the residential restaurant bookstore. Uh, and, uh, and then number two, uh, residential use along, along those areas, uh, along Quinnen, and um, to, to do some residential uses, 10 units. Uh, and so these were identified as opportunity sites on San Pablo Avenue. And they're also outlined, they have some, and in the, in the specific plan itself, it does have you know pictures of what some of the developments could look like in, in that I wasn't able to get those on the slides. So if you go to the next slide, Dave. Okay, that's okay. Okay, that's uh, okay. You can go back to the last slide, please. So, thank you. So that so in terms of that, uh, so those are kind of the opportunity sites that are east, east of Apian Way, uh, and so the the, the specific uh, sorry the specific plan also talks about the infrastructure. Talks about how you know develop that basically the San Pablo corridor is a is a developed area with existing infrastructure. It has all the necessary sewer, water, sewer, storm drainage. However, there could be some improvements to those as development occurs. Uh, improvements to those existing utilities uh, could happen uh, as well as a roadway network. The, uh, of course, San Pablo being that we're incorporated city, the, the corridor is essential, has essential services in terms of police, fire, schools, parks, our street lightings and utilities. Uh, and then, and there are also services that are throughout the city. So those those are existing, and those when new projects are you know there's redevelopment of new projects. You know, some of those things can be improved uh, as part of uh, as part of the projects. In terms of the land use standards, we've kind of we've kind of gone over those in a sense, but basically they're the three sub areas of mixed use, old town, and service. Uh, the San Pablo zoning districts, of course, consist of the eight zoning areas that we talked about. Uh, each of the each of the categories uh, have corresponding uses that are either permitted, not permitted, or conditional. In our in our zoning table, in the specific plan, we have tables for each of the land use areas, APN, San Pablo, and and Pinole Valley Road that outline what the uses are, such as a multifamily dwelling, a retail commercial, theaters, and auditorium, and, and it tells you what is allowed and not allowed, uh, what is permitted, what is not permitted, what requires a conditional use permit. Uh, and so it, it, it gives you a pretty good direction of where development should go. 
In terms of uh, the design standards, uh, the San Paulo corridor has a number of development standards. Uh, development standards include height, height of structures, uh, building placement, setback requirements, allowable building types, and allowable parking types. Excuse me. So it does cover different areas, uh, which all the all of the other areas do as well. In terms of the economic development strategy of San Pablo Avenue, there was a number of points that that were um, that were that were outlined as as part of the San Pablo corridor. You know, market forces are the dominant drivers of the regional economy. Uh, they wanted as part of a strategy to make sure that public sector economic development efforts must focus on factors internal to the workings of the regional economy and under the influence of public policy at any given level of government, be that local, regional, state, or federal. Uh, to have basically as part of that strategy a sensible economic development policy and, and, and build upon the strengths of the regional economy is what is kind of what we were looking at. Because we all we are a smaller community. Sometimes it's easy when you or it's be in between two cities. Sometimes it's better to combine these things. And if Canole's in the middle, that might be a great place to have that more regional facility, or restaurant, or regional retail, or you know regional residential. So, um, which I consider multifamily development is more like regional. Um, so you know you have that option in terms of another economic development strategy for San Pablo. Um, that, that the city should give efforts and pay attention to the needs of lagging that are distressed areas and of groups at the lowest rings of the rungs of the economic ladder. So we should take a look at, at those as well as part of the economic strategy because you know, like they say, you're as strong as your weakest link. And so if we can build up those where those where we identify those weak links and we can build those up, they'll just make Penal a stronger, a stronger community. Uh, also as part of the economic development strategy for San Pablo, that uh, public policy should recognize the regional nature of economic development and advanced strategies that address challenges and opportunities throughout the regional economy. And that we should, and that the city should develop, or not the city, but that uh, economic development efforts should address the development potential of places as well as the needs of people in that place. So what a lot of, what a lot of cities are doing is creating destination, destination developments similar to like what, uh, the new Safeway project did with a lot of their outdoor eating area, with a lot of kind of like their that plaza area they had in front of their other buildings, uh, and it's just so that and a lot of landscaping, so that when people go there, they've got opportunity to go to different shops, they've got a place to sit, gather, you know, those types of things create that destination. And I think San Pablo is one of those using Old Town as that as that major area to be able to do that. So that's that's all I have right now for San Pablo. Um, I know there's probably a lot of questions and we can talk about those. And so if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those or if you have any comments, be happy to go there. So with that, that ends my presentation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I know I covered a lot. So yeah, this is quite a bit. I'm sorry. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Hannum. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, Chair Banuelos is back with us. So welcome. Yeah, hi, sorry. Um, that's all right. We're glad you're here. Um, do you want to? You want me to just continue with this right here, or do you want to go ahead and take over? Uh, I can go ahead and take over. Um, okay. Start with you, Ann. Do you have any questions? Um, yeah, actually, I I I do. I'm I'm thinking of this this the three quarter specific plan is is in a pretty amazing document, um, and I think we've. You know the vision and the thoughts as far as San Pablo Avenue and how we can um, make Pinol and this specifically this part of Pinol um, a better place are are really in place here. The problem has always been implementation and what our um, constraints are. Um, just a, a, for example, um, the whole bike pedestrian infrastructure. Um, I think of right now, how many times we've looked at the corner of San Pablo Avenue and Pinole Valley Road, which is so dangerous for pedestrians um, and continues to be a problem, even with the, the change in the, the, the timing of the light. Um, and San Pablo and Tenant, and now um, I know in our last uh, meeting, we were discussing with the new um, developments, the Saha and the Vista Woods, 
that um, how can we make it safe for seniors to be able to, to walk around? So my, my question then would be is, um, if you could, Mr. Hannum, address some of our constraints as far as circulation, um, that might be helpful. So that would be one thing. And then second, we were going to um, have a map um, or just a thought, um, I appreciate you know these schematics here, but um, trying to figure out how does San Pablo Avenue change as we move from um, San Pablo into Pinole and then Pinole into Hercules. Um, we've talked many times about having a map um, you know that, that we can look at some something big that we can see how do these developments fit in? so that um, within the, the three quarter specific plan, the, the, the things are addressed there. So those are my two major um, issues, you know, thinking about what our constraints are as far as um, transportation and circulation um, and how we can improve bike ped, you know, for, for people in San, on the, the San Pablo Avenue corridor and um, when can we get that map so that we can the, the map is just, the map is harder to do we don't we don't have a lot of GIS capacity here and so and to, to, for, uh, for, for a quarter like this it's going to be basically two big maps we're probably going to do one east of APN way and one west of APN way I mean we could probably do because we'll and also we'll need to be in house we need I think it's better if we're in house it's going to be very difficult to display in a zoom setting uh, we're, that's why i kind of put some of these maps out there so you can kind of see um what what we have in, a, in, a, in that way so um but i'm trying to work on trying to see what i can plot so that we can sit them sit, sit those projects down in I, I, there's gonna be no 3d replicas so i'm not gonna have that but but if we can have the if we can have the um you know at least from a from a I'll just say from a global earth perspective, uh, maybe some, some frontages and, and, and do that. So it's a, we can start working on those and try to create that in the area uh, using Google Earth and try to do that. Um, why we get something where we can draw on and write on and maybe some type of workshop or something of that nature. So that's, I'm trying to, trying to figure out how I'm gonna do this, uh, to be honest. I don't have a 3D, I mean, we can do some 3D stuff and just put some little plops on, you know, this this represents a story or three-story building or something of that nature, but it's, but it, uh, but I'm probably gonna have to use more of the photographs and, and that kind of stuff to make it, and I'll probably have to do some more Google or stuff just because of our GIS capacities and, and, and that, so. I, so yeah, gonna, I think, I think whatever we can get, um, I think will help us and will help the community to, to kind of visualize, because these are, we're looking at some pretty big changes. Um, 179 units, that's big. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so how can, you know, how can we see how the that corridor is changing? I know we've talked about this over, over several months. Right. Um, so, I mean, if there's any way that we can you know, visualize that, that would be, you know, that would be really great. Yeah, I'm probably gonna have to superimpose some, some of the, which I'm gonna have to find because that's something that I'm learning how to do. I, I, so I'm gonna have impose like a footprint of the building or an elevation of the building from a streetscape. Uh, so I'm, but I've got to figure out how to do that using our GIS capacity and what we can do with with Google Earth and try to get a scale on it so that you can that you can read it. It's it was a, it's more difficult than I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be fairly easy, but it's it's turned into a, a major task to do because I'm dealing with about a thousand acres and I'm dealing with about and they're lineal. They're not they're lineal acres, not you know this way. So it covers a lot of ground. So um, so I'm working on stuff that I'm break, trying to break up East Apian and West West of Apian in those two corridor areas. Uh, and so, and I kind of, you kind of saw the, the maps that I used tonight, but I'll have to expand mm -hmm. on those and get some, and that's what I'll probably be doing here. I'm trying to get, trying to figure that out. And I'll get that, done. that would be great. So when you have some downtime in the, uh, holiday season, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
But we'll, we'll, right. we'll I'm and try to that down so you guys can deal with that. Then could you address, um, again, for the community, what the um, constraints are regarding circulation and um, speeding and, you know, those kinds of things and what we can do in planning to help ameliorate those? Sure. Those issues and what we can't do? Well, right now, I mean, there's not a lot, to be honest with you, San Pablo is the main is the main concern. It's a four lane expressway, even though it's not a, even though we've tried to uh, traffic calm through using traffic signals and timing and those types of things. And so, but we still, there's still a lot of traffic on there. So to be able to put, to put parklets out on San Pablo or put outdoor dining on San Pablo or even on the sidewalks of San Pablo, we kind of run into we kind of run into two things. One is that traffic. Uh, one mistake in a rush hour could take out parklets uh, by somebody. Um, our our sidewalks, in terms of the you know they're the standard five six foot sidewalk, but when you start putting tables and chairs out there, it really starts cramping down on on the uh, on the on the sidewalk and get pedestrians be able to walk by it. And so um, now there's a couple of properties that we're fortunate that has that kind of room, like East Bay Coffee has the next has the room. Uh, the property at 2337 San Pablo, they'll be having a, it's more of a gathering area uh, where people can go and they don't have to worry about cars buzzing by them and, and, and that kind of stuff. We're also, so that, so San, the, just the traffic on San Pablo during those, those rush hour times, that, that's a constraint. Um, the the other the other thing that we can do to kind of combat that that is try to use some of the side streets uh to create those outdoor dining or to create those public spaces so that people can get out there and and just and enjoy enjoy San, enjoy Pinole uh by using like tenant and Pinole valley road and uh fernandez uh those three roads those using those three <laughs> roads and creating those parklets or creating those public spaces so that you can kind of get off of the main drag uh, so that you don't have those cars. The, the only other way, which the, which which is the city is, I don't know, the city is trying to, of course, I'm sure Dave, Dave and Tim both have gone through this a number of times of trying to, uh, you know, take San Pablo down to one lane through there, um, which uh, it's, it's probably not impossible, but it's probably 98% undoable. 99%, but it's something that if 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 we really want to take a look at some options and parklets and those types of things, we, we really have to clamp down in those, at least in that three block area uh, between John and uh, between John and uh, uh, Tenant uh, and, 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 and start to look to expand back into Oak Ridge. Uh, but so we've got to, and we've got to be able to do something of that nature. I mean, that would open up that would open up the ability to bring out some parklets because it would give us another 12 feet, 11, 12 feet to, to have out there. Um, and so and and with some repaving and kind of take out some of the crown that, that's in the street. But there, so there'd have to be some street work done there. So those are those are that those are the major constraints in that area for those types of things. As you go down, as you go west towards San Paulo, you've got a little more room on some of the parcels because some of the buildings are set back on the property. So you, you actually have some opportunity to create create some what we call public space or those those types of public spaces. Um, and so that's something that we can also take a look at. Um, we've got some great we've got some great issues on some of the property, but but I think we need to take a look at. Uh, some of those commercial mixed use areas and create create that that look and we have some we have some diagrams and some pictures in the specific plan under the public realm design guidelines and private realm design guidelines um, but what some of that stuff does is it takes away the parking because most of those things are parking lots and so Again, we're going to have to what what some economic developers and, and planning guys say is, is uh, uh, remove some of the furniture, or redesign some of the furniture, and and so where we're taking some parking, we're going to need to add parking in other places, or maybe that requires us putting a garage somewhere that can hold 100 and 150 cars, uh, so that people can park in one spot and be able to walk to other other spots and make San Pablo more of a walkable community. 
uh, and that's that area between Oak Ridge down to, uh, I'm saying Plaza Avenue or down to about uh, um, Pinion or actually even Sunnyview, uh, down in that area, uh, on back all the way down to Meadow. So we would have to take a look at all of those properties and see what, are, what properties are being underutilized, which properties are, um, which properties are, are able to handle more parking or maybe there's Maybe there's an ability to create some parking on a corner and be able to move a building to another. But there's so, but there's a lot of coordination with the property owners and a lot of, a lot of moving parts. So that's a, that's another constraint uh, with it. Doesn't mean it's impossible. Doesn't mean it can't be done. But it just takes a lot of collaboration and making sure that everybody has a um, has the ability to um, uh, you know uh, take, get, get an advantage to it or it, that, that it will help them out with their business and not hurt their business. So that's something that we would have to take a look at and do a lot of compromise. There would have to be like a lot of compromising to do that. So, um, but yeah, so those are some of the constraints. Those are probably the major constraints. Um, and there's some that are regular, there, I mean, some of the littler, some of the little issues mean there's a lot of parcels that are, you know, uh, you know, flag-like parcels, or they're not all even, they're not all, so there has to be some, you know, parcel configuration to, you know, make them a little more even, make them a little more, uh, to make them easier to develop and determine property lines and make sure that, you know, what, who's got what, where, so you're not crossing property lines, because there's a lot of parcels that are, like, right on, the way it's been drawn, especially between, especially once you pass, as you're going west, after you pass Oak Ridge and you come up the hill and you start getting into older parts, a lot of those parcels are irregular. And so to make those parcels a little more regular, uh, a little more conforming, uh, sometimes you can get better use out of those parcels. So that's another another issue that time. Uh, but it's a, that's more on the smaller side, to be honest. That's a, a smaller issue, but that, that's also an issue. But um, so yeah, so those are a couple of the constraints that, I'm, that, that we're looking at. Great, thank you. Um, uh -huh. That's 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 all that you know. I'll let someone else go ahead and um, okay. go through some questions too. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thanks. Can you hear me? You guys hear me? Better, much better. Okay, uh, Adam, do you have any questions or comments? Uh, no, first of all, thank you for taking the time to put this presentation together. It's great. It's actually very helpful to see it all kind of a big picture. Um, question is, how are the priority sites like advertised or you know, presented to developers coming into the city? Well, right now that's something that, you know, when, when we, that was handled through, um, uh, recently it was handled through redevelopment that if people had property, that were looking at properties, we would, you know, we would give them ideas of some some of the priority sites. Um, and I, and that, so it would come through, it would come through, uh, uh, redevelopment or economic development upstairs but now that economic development has now been moved downstairs to community development uh i'm sure lily and i will be working on things to be able to, to uh, get more attraction to these these priority development areas and, and look at different desired uses that we can get to bring into the city so in terms of a business attraction I, I i don't know i haven't seen a lot of the business attraction materials um, i mean the city has been selling their property, so there's been a lot of a lot of good handouts and stuff, and 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 um, looking into the properties that the city's own or that the city owns. Uh, but in terms of in terms of commercial projects or, or parcels that are for sale and those, that's something that we that we're going to take a look at and kind of build a strategy on how we're going to be able to advertise these properties and work with work with the realtor community realtor community to to do some of that, maybe get some links on our website, uh, that kind of stuff and, and move forward there, so. Is that part of like the planning application process where if a developer comes in with a, a site, would you want to say, well, if here's a similar site at the priority site, it matches your zoning, it matches the lot size? We, we, can, we can, depending on what the project is, but we don't normally, I mean, we don't, usually by the time they're they're applying for, for a development, project usually they have a part they've got some control over the part property that they're using yeah. uh we can identify a priority a priority um uh priority development area um and see if they're interested in if there are properties for sale that we would be able to you know transfer to or that but 
that's how that's probably how we would handle that we would suggest but if they if they've said they've talked to those property owners and they're not willing to sell or you know right it's still if the bottom line it still comes down to the property owner wanting to sell his property to, to do it to do the project so yeah okay no oh, thank you uh and again thanks for putting this presentation together uh i don't have any other further questions or comments okay thanks uh rafael Thanks for the presentation, uh, David. I have a few questions, actually. Some of my questions were already addressed way back in. I think it was August when we were discussing the specific plans more as a whole, but I had some more specific questions. Okay. On page number 30-18 uh, or page 70 of the City of Pinole Corridor specific plan under score 2010, talking about existing conditions for San Pablo Avenue constraints. It says physical constraints or obstacles that need to be overcome in a San Pablo specific plan area include wide streets that dedicate a high proportion of the right of way to automobile traffic, narrow sidewalks located near heavy traffic and heavy pedestrian travel, high traffic speeds that conflict with pedestrian activity, Lack of cohesive theme or identity for Avenue, tired looking developments on West End, need for stronger connections between residential and commercial units, uses, and lack of convenient public transit options and connections and inadequate transit amenities, ergo, bus shelters, benches, trash receptacles, etc. We've already discussed some of that tonight, and I know that at the prior meeting where we were discussing this, the plan as a whole, that we were told we couldn't really reduce the size of San Pablo Avenue as a whole because of Caltrans requirements. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's see. Then jumping ahead a bit on page uh, 384 of the specific plan at 10.0-12, there's an implementation segment. And the first point is create a green industry program for industrial areas of Pinole <laughs> Sorry, mm -hmm. that it includes incentivized incentives and streamlined administrative review of eligible uses and support for synergistic relationships between industrial uses. And I was curious whether that had been formally done. On page 388, where it's discussing revised the equipment fee for downtown projects to approve parks in a specific plan areas and public plazas to provide funding for development of cultural amenities. I'm not familiar with the Quimby fee or if that was done. Could you explain that further? On page 397, there's some more discussion of the Quimby Act. It talks about their standards of three to five acres per 1,000 residents of open space. And I was wondering if Pinole met that standard. And then The final thing I noted under Appendix A, page 432, it talked about development constraints and say that market demand said there was limited demand for certain development types, particularly retail, which will f further to limit development potential, which particularly surprised me that we have, you know, hundreds of thousands of acres of proposed new retail square footage given the limited demand for retail development types. I'm also somewhat curious as to the further development of industrial because in the initial plan back in 2010, it looked like there wasn't any industrial use anticipated. And I know that there were several priority sites listed earlier on in the presentation. That's probably a big chunk of where the plan industrial development is, but I'd like to hear more about those if we can. And that's all the questions I have for now. Thank you. Okay, I'll tackle the first one, the last one first. <laughs> the, the industrial, yeah. I mean, the Pinal Shoal, the Pinal Shoal Shores area, prior to well, in 2010, was pretty much undeveloped property. I mean, there was I think one warehouse on there. The city, that was a project that the city, I think the city owned portions of that, and so that when they developed the 2010 specific plan, that was going to be the area where a lot of the more a lot of the industrial development uh, would would go. Uh, for the most part, it it dealt with um, uh, you know by using warehousing, not so much in terms of uh, uses like sugar, uh, the sugar company, uh, concrete, but more of the warehousing, 
those types of more of the light industrial type uses, not the heavy manufacturing uh, type of uses. So, um, so that's kind of where the, those areas were designed as part of the mixed use uh, mixed use areas on that. Uh, in terms of um, and you're going pretty fast on your. I mean, I have the specific plan up, but I've got I've got the pages that you're listing. I'm not. I'm in chapter ten, which is the where you were talking about the uh, the implementation. So, and that's where a lot of your um, a lot of your questions were about the. In terms of the implementation, I'm looking for... On page 384 was the f first chunk of my questions around implementation, I guess. Yeah, see, my page is like 10.07. It would be 10.0-12. 1-2. 1-2. And implementations and adoptions. When you're, um, while you're looking for that data, I can answer the Quimby Act fee questions. Uh, the Quimby Act is a, a state law that governs uh, how much park land should be dedicated for uh, residential subdivisions. Uh, you know, the city does have a Quimby Act ordinance, but, uh, you know, to be honest, I'm not sure when the last time it was uh, used was because the city doesn't have particularly many uh, subdivision new subdivisions that are coming in. Uh, but the city debt related aspect to Quimby Act is the city does have a park um, uh, impact fee for parks and recreation, and that is charged and you know imposed on new all new uh, development, and so the city does collect that. Uh, those funds and there's different, um, excuse me, all not only development, only residential development, and so the city does, you know, uh, impose and collect that on new residential development. There hasn't been sort of a significant amount of new residential development in Pinal over the last, you know, since the the, the specific plan was adopted. Certainly, there are a number of units in the pipeline now, and so when building permits are um, pulled for those projects, those fees will be paid. And, and you know that I think it's for about six thousand dollars per multifamily unit, or, or something along those lines. So, I guess the area that I was particularly curious about with regards to the Quibby fee was on page ten point zero one six under the public realm improvements header where it says revised the could be fee to improve specific particular targeted things. And I was wondering whether the city had done any sort of retargeting of the could be fee at all or whether it was just all going into a generic parks fund. Uh, it's usually, I think it's going into our, our park funds, but I'm not positive. Yeah, it's going into a special fund that is used for um, either you know for new either for new for new facilities essentially. So that could be buying park um, property or more realistically, you know, building new park facilities at park new recreational facilities at parks. In terms of the green, of the green, we haven't we haven't initiated that plan yet. We haven't. Um, that's something that, as we do the greenhouse inventory, as we do the climate action plan, as we do those types of things, we'll be able to um, identify projects that, that might work. But as of now, we haven't we haven't started those. Um, let's see. That was three of your questions. What was the, what was the first one again, Raphael? I apologize. Uh, I guess my question is about the green industry was because several of the priority sites that were flagged were noted as I think potential green industry locations. But let's see, the final one was, I just jumping back to the constraint segment. So it's 3.0-18 for the page number. 
And I was talking about several physical constraints or obstacles that need to be overcome in the San Pablo specific plan area. Now we'd already addressed a number of those in the, in the course of the meeting, but there, there were, I guess one specific question that I have with regards to sidewalks is in the western portion of the sites there's a gap in the sidewalk on the north side of san pablo avenue in between i believe pinion and robel where there's basically a lot that has somewhat of a slope towards basically the street level and there's no sidewalk there so people either need to go to the other side of the street or go into the street to move through that space and i was wondering whether the city was planning on addressing that somehow as part of the complete streets program or other attempts to address that particular constraint within this specific plan area can i add something Raphael? sure um Dave, Raphael is referring to 1456 San Pablo through 1504 San Pablo. It's the hill that's right between those two addresses. Thank you, Raphael. I just wanted to, to make sure that Dave knew exactly where we're speaking about. Okay, yeah, that's right. It's, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty big piece of property. Um, as development occurs, and right now we don't have we don't have a plan to improve the sidewalks along that area, but if if that project does develop, or and that's one of those underutilized projects where um, it's more of a single family house on that on that big parcel. If there is a redevelopment of that, then yeah, curb gutter sidewalk will be uh, would be uh, required for them to uh, to put in. But right now, the city, uh, I'm not quite sure if we own the right it, what how far a right away line goes, if, if we have a right away line that go that extends into that property or not. So that's something that we would have to take a look at to see if we have an easement or some type of where if, if we had a capital improvement or that within our capital improvement plan that we would be able to do. So that's something we have to look at. Yeah, because in terms of where there's gaps and just pedestrian sidewalk access, it's basically that area and of course the whole slope downhill from the church that you can see sort of on the screen here in between Oak Ridge Road and Fair Avenue I think it is I can't quite read the text there but we all know that the hillside there is basically loose stone so you couldn't really safely have a sidewalk there without some sort of rotating wall or other major thing so I, I understand why there's not a sidewalk in there right. the the other major area where there's a sidewalk is the area that i pointed out so i wanted to bring that up while we were talking about constraints on uh pedestrian travel within the san pablo specific plan area because i think that's one of the major limiters on pedestrian travel particularly linking in between the Western and Eastern portions of the specific plan area. Yeah, David, there was a time, uh, I think I was, I was, I think I was the beginning of, of my city council time where there was some looking at the shale hill in terms of, you know, potential lack of stability right. and, um, you know, the, the bonus out of that was to re, 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 um, to recover the sidewalk out of that. Um, at that time, which was, you know, pretty deep in the middle of the downturn, uh, the costs were to, to, to even put retaining walls on that wall, on that hill were astronomical. And they right. still would be. Um, whether the city wants to revisit that in terms of, you know, grants or, or some kind of outside uh, funding sources, that would be something that would be earmarked towards uh, you know, uh, recovering that kind of thing from a civic point of view, that probably, uh, that may be something that's more uh, available now than there was back then. Um, I just was gonna throw that out, because just to let you know, there was some looking at that at one time. 
that's uh, something we might be able to take a look at. I mean, like Caltrans now has some as part of their complete streets programs and as part of their as part of their other pro they've got the sustainable communities program and partnership planning grant opportunities. So there could be some opportunities there to uh, or I mean they're competitive, so I don't know how competitive it would be, but San Pablo is a regional regional highway that serves you know multiple communities and, and that. So there could be a we might have something to take a look at there. That's one we can take a look at. From a yeah, I mean, the flip side of San Pablo not being able to be narrowed because it's a regional highway in an area of importance is that that hillside, if a lot of stuff falls off of it, it blocks the road. That's also blocking a highway of regional importance. So right. apart from the sidewalk issue, the matter of the rotating wall on its own might be sufficient to get support from Caltrans, depending on how exactly all those grants and processes work out. Yeah, I mean, we'd have to we'd take a look at that. We would, we would include that as part of it. Yeah, because it'd be we'd have to take a look at the engineer's wall. estimate, and we'd have to get the whole whole thing. So I'd have to take a look, see if it's, you see if it's even in our capital improvement project, it might be in there, very, you know, uh, you know, for a project that's five, 10, 15 years um, away. So we can take a look at that and see how, what we can do to, if, because the sidewalks are going to be a major, if we're going to be a creative pedestrian type of town and we're going to create more possession, we've got to be able to have the sidewalks and, and close all our gaps and, and, and do that as well. So that's something we can look at. And then I guess my final question with regards to the, I think it was again the, Quimby standard, and that was discussed on page 10.0-25, um, said that the jurisdiction needed to have open space acreage of three to five acres per 1,000 residents. And I was wondering whether the city of Pinole met those standards in terms of the open space it had formally dedicated in proportion to its population. Uh, that I have to take a look at. I mean, most of the Quimby stuff is done with that, with commercial, with residential, and a lot of our, when we built our major residential areas, there were parks that were built in, and there's some regional, there's some, you know, like Fernandez Park counts as Quimby, we can count as Quimby. Um, and so we can take a look, we have to take a look at the acreage and the population and see where we're at and, and see what we, see what we would need to do to build, if, if we're short parks. Yeah, because if we're getting a lot of Quimby funding, that seems like it'd be a good idea for us to have a look and see whether we're, you know, in compliance with that. And if we're not, to figure out how we can get there. Okay. 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 Rafael, did you have anything else? No, I believe that was everything. Thank you. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, Frankie. Thank you, Chair Bowman and Um I guess, uh, Dave, the questions that I have for you tonight um, are right alongside with uh, what Rafael has brought up, and that's the 1456 San Pablo to 1504 San Pablo, and then again, the 19, I think it's 1990 San Pablo to 2100 San Pablo Avenue, um, those heels that we're referring to. Right. Why this is so critical and we, we need to find solutions is at 1456, when that 179 unit goes in with the 179 seniors, they're gonna be on that side of San Pablo. So they need a way to safely get from Robles Avenue all the way down to the senior center if they want to. So I would think that um, Vista Woods going up maybe in the next year at the most two years from today, we've got to find a solution to, for that corridor that allows for a very peaceful way for them to commute from there to the senior center, which is um, a service that I'm quite confident they're going to use on a pretty regular basis. So if there's anything we can do to fast track solutions for that area, it would be really greatly appreciated if we could find some solutions or some options. Okay. 
Yeah, no, we'll take a look at it. I mean, because I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, a lot of this all has to be engineered and all that. So I, I need to see if we had, if the city had has done that in the past and they engineered the property. Um, and depending on where the right of way is, because if, if there is no right of way there, then we'd have to go to that property owner between the big that owns like uh, oh, it's probably 500, but it's in between. But it's in between where you're talking about. We will have to talk to the property owners to see what, what if we can buy an easement. If we, because we'll need some type of easement or some type of of thing, because we're, on, especially on the hill by Oak Ridge, because we'll have to cut mm -hmm. into that hill. That means we're going to be cutting into somebody's property um, to be able to put a to put a sidewalk and a wall there. So. Um, so that's something that we would have to do. But if we can, if we can see if we've got any engineered plans that have been done in the past. Uh, if not, that's something that we'll, we'd have to create as part of our capital and, and included as included as part of our capital improvement program, so that then we can then go for grant opportunities. It's like this, these steps, these different steps that you've got to take to get them. So first step, first first thing is to find out if we have any existing drawings on these things. If not. Uh, what would it cost us to, to do that? And then if we've got property right of way, so we can find out a couple of those things uh, fairly quickly. And then, the, but depending on what those answers are, it could be a, a long road, but it's one that I think that we probably should, should start taking a look at how we're gonna improve that area. Uh, Cause it could, it, it's, it's you know, where, where we can uh, and be able to make sure and include the safety of San Pablo. So, um, but so yeah, we'll work on that. We can we can take a look at those. Thank you, Dave. And then, um, I guess uh, looking at building upon this corridor, right? Um, from the addresses of about twenty one thirty seven San Pablo, which is just after East Base um, uh, outdoor area, which is mm -hmm. the first house, and going to about I think it's about twenty five twenty nine San Pablo Avenue. Uh -huh. um, we may want to red strike that pretty quick and fast. Um, recently, I've noticed that cars are parking there in front of those three Victorian homes where there's not the cut in for the parking. So what ends up happening um, on that, Dave, is you got a car that's parked in the middle of that major thoroughfare and cars and buses have to go complete, right? Because the bus stop is also there. And so, you know, when people don't know that it should technically be a red stripe zone they are parking there so we as an immediate thing we could probably should address that and fix it and then more importantly why that's a bigger issue um is i believe we if i remember right um at some point that bridge between Pinol and hercules um has already been funded to be replaced and at some point we're going to replace that and we're going to need to make sure that we can get those cars in and out of the two cities as efficiently as possible. Mm -hmm. So um, if we could look into that, um, uh, those constraints on that, I would, I think that might serve the city really well. And yeah. then, um, let's see, I th think that addresses the bulk of my questions. Mm -hmm. um, but then uh, if we can just also ask staff to open up conversations with Westcat, um, and I think it's the, is it WeTAC that addresses our transportation to ensure that once um, we add the housing for Vista Woods and the Saha project that we make sure that there's adequate bus service for all the folks that need to use those services from those um, uh, public facilities, the transportation district. Yeah, and I have calls into them right now. So I have, I have calls into Westcap right now. So okay. I'm waiting for some messages to get back, waiting for them to get back to me. So, um, so yeah, I, I am doing. I we are opening conversations with them, just getting the getting to meet with them and, and all that kind of stuff. So, thank you for being so clear on that. And those that completes my questions. Thank you, uh, David. Just got a couple of quick things is that I think we should remember that um, San Pablo Avenue is actually part of the uh, Lincoln Highway, uh, which was actually the first uh, uh, designated road that went coast to coast. And uh, it has a lot of history of it, including the 
1919 when Eisenhower was <clears throat> part of a, uh, a convoy that went all the way from Gettysburg to uh, San Francisco and passed to our city uh, back in 1919. Um, I also want to clarify about uh, the reason why um, we can't do anything with San Pablo Avenue. I don't believe, you know, you just kind of mentioned about being Caltrans, but I actually think it's part more the fact that uh, in, uh, that San Pablo Avenue is, was designated as a, region, a route of regional significance by uh, the County Transportation Authority uh, as part of Measure J. And uh, for us to do anything with San Pablo Avenue, would require the concurrence of all of the um, surrounding cities uh, that would be impacted by any changes in traffic. And I think that was that's really the reason why there's a constraint there, uh, that there's not an interest with uh, like Hercules or any other city that, you know, is gonna create a bottleneck there. And my third point is that when we talk about outdoor dining, I know that La Familia restaurant and the business park there uh, did have some outdoor seating and for some reason that was removed and I thought it was a really good idea that especially during the pandemic for them to have that outdoor seating and I, I don't know what transpired there for them to have to remove it but boy if there's ever a, a good place for a restaurant to have outdoor seating that was it and I, I really was surprised to see it gone. So anyways, those are just the three points that I have. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Yeah, hey, uh, David, do you remember what that development used to be called before it's, you know, the, the original name to it? What, the Pinot, the, the Pinot Business Park, you mean? Yeah, it had a yeah. specific name. Uh, no, I'm sorry, David. Wrong, David. <laughs> I always thought it was Pinot, Pinot Business Park, but yeah, because there was another name, because there's actually two pieces to it. There's the one you see, yeah. and there's another piece behind it. Yeah, you know, we, we call it Pinole Shores um, 1 and 2. I mean, that's kind of how we identify uh, identify those areas. Yeah, there was, a, there was another name even before that that was, I think, had to do with the developer's name, I think, the original developer's name. Okay. Might have been. I can't remember what it is. Though. I thought maybe you remember. No, I don't, but I think it is, it, it is interesting that uh, um, I was there the other day at La Familia to pick up some stuff, and I was really amazed at how well that fitness center is doing there. Uh, I mean, you couldn't even, it was hard to find parking. Oh, you know, of course, there was plenty of parking there. And, and of course, I think that one of the unique businesses that moved in there was this uh, that rubber glove distributorship that's taking uh, the back buildings there. And it, that seems to be a thriving business. Oh, yeah, so, the, the latex um, factory, yeah. The latex, yeah. Yeah, I, um, I remember when that went in. Yeah. Yeah, I know. So, I mean, it's actually uh, was something that was when it was first built was a real hard sell to get anything in there. I think there was the only thing there was the dental office uh, the de and uh, all of a sudden it all filled up. And uh, I think that's really good. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, during my time. But, uh, okay. But thanks. Yeah, thanks for reminding me of that stuff. Sure. Um, let's see who if I, I I've got a New computer and I'm still trying to work out the bumps and it was made for me and I just has. Okay, this is oh, this there, is Sarah, Sarah, Sarra Sarra. Wall. I think yeah, I'm the only one left before you. Okay, Simon, I, I was looking for. Yeah, and and sorry, sorry for uh, you know those who are tuning in that I uh, have a internet problem. I'm not able to show my face, but I'm listening. So I lo I, I want to uh, ask one question only, and before I do that, I want to you know you know thanks all the other commissioners of raising a lot of lot of good questions tonight. But my question is back to, uh, um, you know, David Hannah and or actually, you know, attorney Alex is uh, in terms of as a planning commission, uh, what is our restrictions? How much can we do and how many of those items have been brought up? You know, it's we might not be able to make decisions that we need actually city council to, uh, to act upon, you know, to, uh, to make things happen. Do you want me to go first, Alex? Or? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I think from a from a commission standpoint, I mean, we can always the commission through through staff. I mean, we can take a look at these items and see, you know, kind of kind of ferret some of them out in terms of you know of of what we can do, and then take a look at specific plan and if bring it back to the commission for a formal action to recommend to the city council, uh, and then the city council can take take action one way or the other. So. Um, 
so in terms of what you guys can do, I mean, if staff puts together, if you guys are directing staff to kind of put some of this stuff together and take a look at it, uh, you you guys can always vote on something and recommend something to the city council, and then it'd be up to the city council to review and approve or review and deny, depending on what on what the action is. So, um, so yeah, you do have some say. I mean, per se, I mean, you have the ability to to make recommendations to the city council. So if that's something that, you know, we want to do, this commission wants to do, then you have that ability to do that. So, um, but we would, before it went to the council, we would ferret out all those issues. For example, if you wanted to, if the commission wanted to, wanted staff to take a look at maybe potentially do a grant application for a, for let's just say a, a sustainable communities grant, then we would have to go into the staff. We'd go back and take a look and see, you know, what type of project, what would we, what would we do, you know, how would we finance it, all the particulars, and then bring it back to you for a recommendation to the council. So, um, so that's kind of how that would kind of work. So, Alex, if there's anything else that I'm you know, missing, or yeah, I would add that I mean, much of this is outside the, the general scope of the planning commission's authority um, the you know the planning commission isn't you know by way of example for the the sidewalk completion program like the the planning commission's role in the capital improvement plan is just to confirm whether or not it is consistent with the general plan it, it's not really to add items individual items to the capital improvement plan that's the role of the city council but the you know the planning commission can certainly uh, i don't think the city council would be offended if the planning commission you know passed along recommendations to uh the uh city council about you know any number of of topics yeah thank you because you know what, what, what i hear a lot you know from other commissioners a lot of exciting thing that 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 as a as a pending commissioner we, we would like to get together and, and get some input and, and get some you know movement because you know for the last couple of you know um you know commission you know the fact that uh you know, hey, you know, things are going a little bit slower than we expected. You know, there is, you know, community concern about it and their stuff. And then a lot of times it's, it's that, you know, we do not really have, you know, uh, the, the, the right to it or even the right, you know, the, the rights, you know, uh, to, to make decisions. So if we can actually do something by, for example, like asking, you know, uh, our planning staff to, you know, make some study or suggesting some ideas so the city council can actually move that forward. I think that is something that some some of the action that we as the as the commissioner can uh, can, can help on. And there's no more questions and comments. Right. And I, I apologize, I didn't need to interject there. Um, Alex, it's it's important to note that city council is maybe not always aware of these projects that are in the pipeline. And especially when we look at adding almost 200 units on San Pablo in those corridors, if we don't point out that we have no sidewalks for the um, for the folks at Vista Woods to get safely from one part of, from where they live now into Old Town, because it was never pointed out by Planning Commission, they would have zero visibility into this issue. So we, I don't know what the correct process we need to create, but we need to open up the communication. So as city council's looking at something, um, looking at the capital improvement plan, they need to be aware that we've got these projects that planning commission is working on that need to integrate into that plan. Otherwise that funding won't be there and we're gonna stumble with this. So Dave, just, I guess the question goes back to Dave Hanham. Dave, what, what do we do to ensure that city council's aware of these big projects with a couple hundred people moving in and the, the the challenges that were that will become of them we, we can do a couple we, can, we can kind of do a couple of things i guess i mean one i i can work with public works department and trying to you know maybe there might be some uh some additional items that they're actually looking to to, to do the plans they update the capital improvement plan every year so um or at least they at least they 
they review projects the yearly projects every year so there could be an opportunity there to be able to uh, to maybe add something or maybe or recommend so not add but recommend adding the project or you know and the reason why we're adding it is because we want to go after grant funding and it needs to be in the capital improvement i mean there's a lot of different you know hurdles that we would have to climb to probably get something in there so i know there probably wouldn't be enough capital dollars from the city's perspective we definitely need to go out to this some grant money for um but um but that, it could be something like that and so we would take a we need to talk to public works and see what their cycle is and start that process and and see what we could do to maybe do that or add that project or um or at least get it somewhat scoped out of what what it is we're looking for and, and then pursue some grant opportunity allow the council to allow us to pursue some grant opportunities to get it built if thank you uh, through the chair if i could interject briefly here yeah go ahead so a couple of points on this one thing is that the well the council does have a regular employment implementation time for the capital approval plan. It also has routine quarterly reviews of progress on the capital approval plan. I believe it was a consent calendar item at just the meeting this past Tuesday for the council looking over the implementation of various capital approval plan items. It wasn't discussed very much because it was a consent calendar item, but I just want to note that it's not necessarily just a once yearly thing that the capital approval plan is brought up, it's brought up more frequently than that. And I guess this is sort of more to David Hanhan. It seems to me as though there's sort of a couple of overlapping things that could be done here. There's obviously at the farthest end, there's making a formal request to the council to create a unfunded capital improvement project and potentially allocate funds to that project. But at stages before that, there's having staff look into whether there's grants, having staff look into, like you said earlier, whether the city has any easements or rights of way and so on. So I'm wondering with regards to agenda items for the commission, I know this is sort of moving into later on in the meeting, but would it be possible to have agenda items that are like initial examination of possibilities around those two particular areas in order to overcome identified constraints in the San Pablo specific plan area? Or would it need to be more general or more detailed than that? Well, it would probably start as, as a general and get more specific as we go. So it would be something like if we, if the, can, if the commission was willing to take a look at those different different areas and what can be done in those areas at that point, then we can zero down that, you know, one, we can create a path, we can create a sidewalk, we can, you know, do a retaining wall, we can do those type of things. And so it usually starts off pretty general in nature and then gets more specific as we get more that as we define the project um so um anyway I, rec I recommend that if there's an issue an item that that you think needs to be on our agenda or something of that nature that we can do the research and and um and take a look at trying to get it back on the agenda uh with what we found and what what the next steps and actually outline what those steps would be uh, to achieve in terms of timing, I, I don't want to guarantee any time. You know, I'm not going to say 5, 10, 15, 20 years because it could be there's a number of different steps that has to be taken for these projects. And all, you know, from identifying the project, identifying the project cost, doing the environmental, uh, you know, looking for grant opportunities, uh, you know, maybe some one time grant dollar somewhere. Uh, so, uh, or it gets included as an unfunded plan as part of our capital improvement plan. Improvement plan. Um, so there's just a lot. Of, so we start from more of a general nature and start getting more specific as we narrow in, narrow in, narrow in the project and, and look at different, different opportunities for it. But we can we can take a look at that. Yeah, the first thing we should do, uh, David, is to uh, have our joint meeting and tell them ourselves first. Yeah. And, and, and so they because you, you're right, they don't know because they're, they're dealing with so many other things, you know, uh, that's why certain things like 
the periodic uh, looking at the capital improvement plan blow through on consent items because there's bigger fit you know, in their in their minds there are big, there's bigger fish to fry. Right. And um, this is something that uh, every everyone who's who's commented on here it, it comes back to the same thing at this particular spot, and it's now where it was kind of like during the time when there was no money. Uh, it was almost like a pipe dream level to something that's really something that has to be really seriously taken a look at. Right. And I think, you know, this is the kind of thing why you have joint meetings. And um, it's not like report card time. It's, it's really, you know, here's, here's the things that we're dealing with and here's the things we're finding out as we're dealing with them. Right. Because from our end, generally speaking, we're only good for land use. But as soon as you start talking about money, it has to bump immediately to the city council. So we have to tell them how important it is in order for that to start. And you know, David, you've mentioned all kinds of things in terms of the, the process. And um, those are all, you know, that, that all makes total sense in how that works. But we kind of have to jumpstart this a little bit. You know, I mean, and everyone, it's, I think everyone's in agreement. This is, you know, this is trouble brewing right now. And um, these are the kind of things that while it's, Technically not under the purview of the Planning Commission. Uh, it still kind of is because we spotted something that needs to be fixed. And there, there isn't really a direct mechanism, and maybe David, you and I should talk about this, of the Planning Commission uh, approaching the City Council in terms of things like this, other than the joint meetings that we used to have. So, so this would be uh, like we could do a whole meeting just on this alone, you know, and uh, I, I really think we need to push to have that joint meeting occur, sure. which means occur and you mean push means it won't happen for two months. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. but, on everybody's agenda, but yeah. we got to if we don't if we don't do it now, yeah. we, it could be a year and we're and, and we're still looking at the same problem, except it's getting worse because things are going to start getting ready to be built. So, um, one, uh, and not to say, you know, just separate from the joint meeting, too, you know, the planning commission can always, you know, apart from just speaking as individuals, you know, designate or, or sort of instruct the chair or vice chair to go, you know, give public comment, mm -hmm. you know, at the, on behalf of the planning commission to, you know, just put something on the, uh, council's radar so they are aware of it and you know council can then ask staff let's have this as a future agenda item if it's something they think uh, needs to be agendized at the council level mm -hmm. as well well so, that might be something that we need to do relatively immediate because we could do that it could be as easy as the next meeting it's council meeting if it's a citizen to be heard type of thing it's kind of unfortunate that we have to you know, essentially resort to something like that because we have no mechanism. That's if we have that, that's actually probably the biggest thing to do. So I would be totally in favor of doing that. If you were to do that, then what I would recommend that and probably Alex would probably pack this up is that we would need a motion and a, and a, and a second on a, on a, and a consensus on the item, and then a person who is representing the planning commission, so that we so that the whole planning commission is voted on. It's a it's a whole planning commission issue, not just one planning commissioner. You know, they can speak in. Front, but I mean, if this is an issue for the entire commission, I think that motion and second would be uh, appropriate to uh, and a consensus on what the type, what who's going to speak in front of the city council and what that item should be. Okay. Yeah. So we should bring it up during our agenda search time to get it in our list and quickly. So. Uh, I think everyone's spoken. I didn't miss anybody, right? So I'll uh, do do my thing on this. Uh, thanks for the. Uh, this is a, was a really good uh, review of this, uh, David, and it made me kind of think of uh, something I used to hear when I was in school. You know, you sweat and you and you and you you know, lose blood over a project, or up for a couple of nights finishing something up, or showing to show somebody, and then the first thing to tell you to say to you was, "Well, you're off to a good start." <laughs> and I know you've been sweating over this for a long time because we've talked about it a, a lot in the last several months. 
And so I think this was really, really good to see. Um, I might be able to come in and talk to you about doing a 3D version of something like this, as long as it's really, really simple, because I might be able to do that. Okay. Um, so let's let's kind of see about a time to come in out and see what we can figure out. Okay. It would probably be, it'd just be three-dimensional blocks of what you have, because you know doing a more anything more detailed would take quite some time. Right. Something basic and using Google Earth as the background wouldn't be that hard to do, really. Okay. So um, let's get together and talk about that. So okay. I can start to figure out when I would do it. Okay. Um, I'm very uh, excited to hear all these ideas that you guys have all had in terms of, of seeing this, cause especially seeing this where, where, where it came from. You know, at the time that we were developing the specific area plans, this was by far the hardest one because there were so many things going on, so many things not going on, and so many directions to go on this. And, you know, 2010, you know, we were, you know, in the Stone Age compared to now, the things that have happened. And, um, you know, we were also, we were, you know, starting to really start to feel the, the downturn towards the end of this process when we were doing these specific area plans. So it was like lots of great ideas and maybe we'll see them in our lifetime was kind of the feeling at that time. So, but here they are. And here's the reason why to do a lot of these things we've talked about. The Shale Hill has been a subject that's come up over and over and over again in the last 10 years. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure you won't find anything, David, because there, nothing was ever really done. Sure. Because even the engineering on this was, was costly. Uh, there was a lot, I think there might be some kind of ba real basic concept thing in terms of how that would be, uh, how the, how the hill would be protected and how and what what direction to go in but there probably no so nothing that even resembles a solution right if that if best there are at least two different park uh, at least as far as I remember I think there's at least two different uh, street calming projects for the immediate downtown and um, the combination of the the the, the regionalness of San Pablo Avenue with pushback from the local merchants, um, you know, because they're concerned about not being able to get low, uh, you know, deliveries out in front of their places because the streets were too narrow. Um, were some of the, was the two big things that kind of killed those things. Um, that's not to say that past that, and as we go up towards where the developments are, um, one of the things I was thinking about, and we've talked about this, David, is are those lanes wider than than like a standard lane in terms of that area. Right. And can we shave off by making the names, lanes narrower and, but maintaining the number of number of lanes? Can we buy some space? Um, you know, that was something that we, we you know, I kind of batted, have batted around, you know, off and on as a possibility. That might be something we could take a look at uh, in terms of what goes on within the right of way but still maintaining the, the, the regional significance of the, of the San Paolo Avenue. Um, just because you see a fence at the road doesn't mean the property goes there. So if we have two, two uh, properties with sidewalk on, on each side, one with a blank, and you connect the dots, most likely that right away is in the, on the other side of that fence. Right. Um, so it would be, it gets a little, you know, the people, once they put the fence up, think it's theirs and not, not, not everybody's. And so it's a little bit of a difficult thing, but um, I think it's even more difficult to have developments that you can't walk to downtown from uh, or to and from. So uh, that would be something that would be, you know, a matter of looking at parcel maps for that kind of thing. That would be, that would take minutes to figure some of that stuff out. Yeah. Um, the of all the the de the developments that have that were planned for San Pablo Avenue. Um, this, this this amount of res, residential was never really uh, expected in terms of that being down there. Um, the property, the Pinol, whatever you're calling that, Pinol Business Park, or Pinol Shores Business Park, or whatever that was, and I'll probably remember in a couple of weeks what, what the old name was. It'll pop up to me. Um, one of the reasons that that doesn't have potential for residential or things like that is because they were concerned about what was coming out of the ground out of that area because of what it was in the past. And um, 
I think it was cleaned up at the time, but one, some of, one of the stipulations in, in the rezoning of that area was to make sure that people wouldn't live there. And um, quite frankly, I'm surprised that we were able to allow a restaurant in there, because I thought well, one of those things was not having anything resemble food going in there. So um, something must have either evolved out of it or decided it was not a big deal or, or whatever. But um, mm -hmm. as much you, you know, like I mentioned earlier, uh, it's really two pieces. There's the front piece that we see that's, you know, pretty close to developed and which was always supposed to be sort of like manufacturing and, you know, some office space and that kind of a thing. Uh, the back area that's undeveloped is, was pretty much more of the same. Um, there was a time when someone's uh, sort of postulated about what, what if we ever wanted to have any kind of uh, marijuana business where, we, where things were, were made, that would be the place back there, but it was never you know, taken that seriously. And so that was before everything became legal. It was almost more of a joke than anything else. But, um, but still, there's still, there still development there. And that was kind of considered the real, the real only light manufacturing type area because other things were, gonna, were, were sort of planned to go on in there, of which you know, residential was one of them, but it was a couple of spots and, and relatively high density. So um, now, you know, things are changing and, and things are coming through that we weren't sure we'd ever even see. And, um, and it's a good thing. And so now we have to figure out how to get the infrastructure to back up, to catch up with it. So um, I think everything everyone has said tonight is, is to hit the nail on the, uh, right on the head here in terms of what's really uh, was, a, was a problem all along. And now we're in a position where maybe we can we start the wheels turning to do something about it. Uh, so um, that's really all I had to say, other, you know, other than uh, uh, bringing up the idea of trying to let the city council know as soon as possible. So um, again, thanks, to, uh, David, for this presentation. It was it was, it was very good. Uh, you didn't have to, you know, thrill us with three D stuff, you know. <laughs> but you certainly, you certainly got the message apart across. Oh, I've got some more up my sleeve, so. <laughs> yeah, oh, okay, I'll have to come in and, and see how, how, those, how those are, so. Um, so with that, I guess uh, we can go on uh, to the next thing under new business, which is the 2021 housing legislation presentation. And uh, before, before I do that, uh, should you check to see if there was any public input? Oh, okay. Oh, we didn't do that? Okay. Uh, is there anyone from the public that want to speak on this? Uh, I don't have I don't I don't have anybody in the in the email. So unless unless there's some hand raise or Justin has any calls on his end, no, I don't see any hands raised. Okay, this might have like a delayed action that someone may say something in the future at another meeting, referring back to this. So because uh, I'm sure this is going to pique some interest with a lot of people. Uh, so uh, we'll just kind of make sure we kind of keep our ears open for something like that. So thanks, David, for reminding me. I didn't know where you were on that. So, um, so yeah. So uh, with that, then I guess we can go to the, the housing legislation presentation. You ready for that? Uh, thank you, and I I will um, try to make this uh, quick because I know it, it's getting late. But feel free. Um, I don't know, uh, Chair. I'll defer to you if you want questions to wait until end or people ask questions as uh, we go through whatever you prefer. Can I, uh, can I, is it okay to take a, a quick kind of consensus about yeah. if this is something made of a million parts, do you want to wait to the end or, or do them as we go along? I'm, I, I could go either way myself. So I'm looking at the will of the commission on that. Does anyone have any comments on that real quick? I, I think it's best to um, see, to if there's some clear, points of clarification or just a quick comment, I think the commissioner should be allowed to do that, but if there's something that's involved, I think we should wait to the end. Okay. Anyone else have a comment on that? Relate to that? Anyone feel like that would be okay? David Current on that. Okay. If we have some just some quick clarification okay. type type stuff, we'll check it at the end of whatever pieces you have in here, and then okay. we'll do the big questions at the end. Perfect. Um, so the. There are basically three main bills that were passed this year and that will go into law on uh, 
January 1st, there were a number of smaller bills, but the three larger ones are SB8, uh, it is missing from that side, SB9 and SB10. And uh, SB9, I'm sure many of you have heard about, there's been some media coverage about that. And that is the, um, the bulk of this presentation because it's by far the most uh, significant uh, bill. So next slide, please, thanks. So those are the three um, bills we're gonna cover, SB9, SB10, and, and SB8. Uh, Next slide, please. So we're one one more, Dave. Sorry, thanks, Pat. So SB nine is the first bill we're going to talk about. You know what SB nine does um, is it requires ministerial approval um, without a hearing of uh, you know taking a single lot and developing two project two uh, residential units on that lot and or dividing that into a, um, a two lot subdivision. So you can imagine um, if you do both of those things, a, a parcel that was previously had one single family home on it could theoretically have four units on that um, if this law was fully um, you know, pursued to its maximum. So next slide, please. So qualifying criteria, one more slide. Thank you. So uh, there, some restrictions on SB9 and where these projects um, or where these projects are allowed. So uh, the lot must be within a single family residential zone. So that means uh, a zone that is primarily for single family residences, not just um, a parcel that has a single family home on it, but a zoning district that is primarily for single family um, residences. Um, the lot must be within an urbanized area that is all of Pinole. Um, under the legal definition, all of Pinole would meet that. And frankly, almost every, all, almost all of every city in the state would be that. You know, every city in the nine county Bay Area or seven web, you know, would qualify. Um, really, only some of those tiny rural towns or unincorporated areas aren't uh, don't qualify as an urbanized area. Uh, under the definition used by the state. Next slide, please. Um, SB9 projects are prohibited within a, a historic land, if there's a historic landmark on the site or if it's a designated historic district. So if, um, you know, under federal or state law, it's a designated historic district or if under state, um, under state or federal or local designation, there is a historic landmark on on the site. Um, if it's in or if it's on certain uh, sensitive areas, so if it's wetlands or an earthquake fault zone or um, lands under conservation easement or you know a, a relatively common one, a high fire uh, severity zone. What I would note is that these uh, sensitive areas are all defined by state law. Um, and so it's not up to local jurisdictions, for example, to decide where the high fire severity zone is. That's based on maps produced by Cal Fire. Um, similar, you know, where an earthquake fault zone is, is a specific, you know, maps produced by the state geologist. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and one more slide. So, uh, by way of example, also, even though there are these per, uh, restricted areas, there tends to be some carve outs narrowing those uh, exceptions. So, you know, you can't build in the 100, uh, the FEMA 100 uh, foot flood plan, excuse me, 100 foot flood plain, uh, tongue twister there. But uh, if you get a letter of map revision from FEMA, you know, or you've uh, done meeting some other minimum flood management criteria, you can still uh, qualify for an SB9 project. Next slide, please. Or similarly, in a uh, high fire severity zone, um, if the city for some reason has chosen to exclude you from the zone, you uh, can apply. Or if the site has adopted fire hazard mitigation measures, which are basically fire hardening measures that the um, 
that are set forth in the building codes, um, you could still qualify for an SB9 project. Next slide, please. So, and there's, uh, you know, just for a way of background, there are a bunch of other locations, many of which aren't applicable to Pinole where these projects are prohibited. Next slide, Dave, thanks. So, in addition to uh, those general restrictions, there also are some anti-displacement requirements in the law. So, a project cannot involve the demolition or alteration of uh, deed restricted affordable housing, housing that's been um, withdrawn from the rental market within the last 15 years, or housing that's been occupied by a tenant in the last three years, um, or rent controlled housing. There's no rent controlled housing in, in Pinole, but these other types of housing um, are present in Pinole. That doesn't mean that an SB9 project couldn't exist on those properties. The project just simply couldn't involve the demolition or alteration of that structure. So if there was a house uh, in front of a lot that had was occupied by a tenant within the last three years, but there was a big backyard and you could fit a second unit in the back, that would be fine as long as it didn't alter the, the front unit at all. Next slide, please. Um, thanks, Dave. Uh, so ministerial approval, like I mentioned, the uh, entitled to ministerial approval of the development of up to two residential units. So that could be on a vacant lot, you add two new units, or that could be you have one existing unit and you add an additional uh, unit. So you have two units on a lot where there previously, uh, previously was one. Next slide, please. Um, also ministerial approval of a two lot subdivision. So you take one lot and you divide it in two so that it is now two lots. Um, there are some restrictions on this. So um, each lot must be a minimum of 1,200 square feet. That's, that's quite small, but that's the minimum uh, that the city can require. But also the lots must be divided relatively equally in size, which means that this uh, neither lot that is created can be less than 40% of the original lot. So if you had a um, 10,000 square foot uh, lot, for example, uh, and you want to divide it, one lot, the small, both lots would have to be at least 4,000 square feet. Uh, once a lot is divided, you can't divide it again using SB9 and also adjacent parcels. Uh, can only be subdivided if the owners act independently. So if one person uh, owns two adjacent parcels, they can't subdivide them both. Um, and if the two owners can't work uh, together to subdivide them both. Uh, next slide, please. And because it's a ministerial approval, the uh, city has very limited ability to deny the subdivision or the uh, development of a second unit. Basically, so, excuse me, only possible if the building official makes a written finding based on preponderance of evidence that the project would have a specific health and safety impact that can't be mitigated. That um, That's very similar to the same standard for denying uh, concessions in the density bonus project. You may remember we've talked about that before, and it's a, a very, very high standard to me. It's very hard to meet. Next slide, please. Uh, but uh, one more slide, please, Dave. Thanks. So even though there are uh, these general, uh, you know, a lot of restrictions on local control, Local control has not been completely uh, invalidated and the law does allow um, local agencies to impose some requirements. So on a subdivision, on the you know, two lot subdivision, the local agency can require easements to make sure there's you know, lots of access, both lots of access to public right of way. Um, and so that public services can be provided so that you know sewer laterals and uh, uh, similar utilities can uh, have access to both lots, but can't require uh, dedication of right of way 
construction of offsite improvements or correction of non-conforming zoning conditions. So, for example, if the project on the um, you know, if a project was going to subdivide, we couldn't require dedication of right away if none, uh, if that didn't exist already, um, if something was going to divide for this project, um, which is something you might normally do on a large subdivision project, is you know requires new streets to be constructed or things like that. Uh, next slide, please. In addition, uh, the city can impose objective zoning standards. Um, and as you uh, may remember, an objective zoning standard is a st standard that's uniformly verifiable um, and not based on any personal judgment. So, you know, saying a fifth 16 foot height limit, that is a objective standard. Saying the height must be similar to surrounding buildings would be subjective. So cities can impose objective zoning standards um, subject to some limitations. So the first limitation is no setback can be required if a unit is built within the footprint of an existing structure. And, uh, and other, except in that situation, uh, the setback for rear and side yards is a maximum of four feet. Those may sound familiar because both of those things are also required of ADUs. Um, and also any of the zoning standards the city adopts, these objective standards cannot physically prevent uh, two 800 square foot units from being built. So for example, the city could adopt a lot coverage requirement, but if on a particular project that lot coverage um, requirement would prevent an 800 square foot unit from being built, the city can't um, enforce that requirement. Next slide, please. Uh, so there's also some rental restrictions uh, that are built into the law. Um, not only, uh, well, uh, let me rephrase that, uh, the city is required to prohibit short term rental of any units created through SB9. So not only do we have the ability to do that, we're actually required to prevent the short-term rental of these units. Uh, and for lot splits, an applicant must submit an affidavit that it intends to occupy one of the principal residents for at least three years. Those are the only owner occupancy standards that the law allows cities to impose. And if you were paying close attention to that bullet point, you'll notice it's, it's very weak. It uh, simply says that the city uh, can require the applicant to submit an affidavit that it intends to occupy one of the units. It doesn't say that the uh, owner has to occupy the units uh, for that three year period. Theoretically, uh, you know, someone is signing an affidavit under penalty of perjury. There are penalties for lying, but it would be very hard to prove someone was lying at the time they signed it and not simply that, you know, their circumstances changed and they decided it was, you know, no longer best to move to live there. Uh, next. Hey, Alex, I have a question yeah. on that. Is those three years, uh, it doesn't say anything about them being contiguous. It, it is for the for the first three years. The the it's law the itself okay. is a little clearer. Okay. Um, so somewhat, I guess, sort of, quite frankly, someone's going to have to sign something saying that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is essentially just the honor system because there's not really any way for the city to enforce that. You know, if you move, the city has no way of knowing that for the most part, unless you sell the property, mm -hmm. uh, and even then. Uh, the, to be able to prove you intentionally lied in your affidavit would be you know, very difficult for the city to, to do. Um, next slide, please. Uh, parking restrictions. So for an SB9 unit, a uh, city can require one parking spot unless uh, the project is within one half mile of a high quality uh, transit corridor that would be um, 
you know, existing rail or bus rapid transit station, a ferry terminal, um, or a fixed bus route with headways of 15 minutes or less. As we've discussed before, um, at this time, at least none of those exist within Pinole. Um, you know, Westcat might change its service at some point so that there are those 15 minute headways. Um, but other than that, there are none of these. So par um, parking one spot per unit could be required in Pinole, um, ex unless there is an area where a uh, uh, car share vehicle is located, in which case it's a one block. You need to be one block away from, if you're more than one block away from that, parking could be required, excuse me. Uh, next slide, please. So ADUs, as many of you know, ADUs are also required to be uh, to be permitted in many situations. Uh, the law is very clear that if you do an SB9 lot split, so you take a single family lot and you divide it into two, uh, you cannot both build two units on both of those lots and have an ADU on both of those lots. So you couldn't build two units and then also build an ADU on both of those lots such that you would suddenly have six units. What the law is uh, silent about is whether if you don't split your lot and you build a second unit, are you also entitled to have an ADU? And the law is not uh, uh, clear on that at all. It doesn't mention that. I would imagine we would expect HCD to put out some guidance on that. And there are a number of things that I would anticipate the legislature to clean up in the uh, next year. Um, you may remember, you know, when the legislature adopted ADU legislation, they had two or three cleanup bills, you know, over the next two to three year period as the law was implemented and they both saw problems or inconsistencies with the law or, you know, also saw cities implementing the laws in ways that maybe the legislature didn't like. And so they would prohibit things that they saw cities doing um, or that they heard feedback about were sort of interfering with their goals. So just by way of example, you know, the le there's nothing in this law at all about impact fees uh, or sewer and water connection fees. You may remember that there are limitations on what the city can charge with regards to fees for ADUs. There are no such restrictions in this law regarding SB9 units. Um, I might, I would say, you know, if I was going to bet on it, I would say in the next year or two, the legislature will come back and probably add something about that to uh, the law would be my uh, guess. So next slide, please. Uh, and thanks. So relationship to CEQA, um, SB9 projects are, because they're required to be ministerially approved, they're not subject to CEQA. CEQA only applies to discretionary projects. Um, and similarly, any local ordinances the city adopts to implement SB9 are not projects for the purposes of CEQA. So if the city adopts uh, objective zoning standards for SB9 projects that wouldn't be subject to uh, environmental review under CEQA. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one more. One more. So that's just, sorry, Dave, you just want to fill that out all the way. Um, so thank you. So you see, um, if the project meets all the SB9 requirements, it's in a single family zone, it's in urban cluster, which would be all of Pinole, it doesn't satisfy any of the, uh, trigger any of the displacement restrictions. That's a permitted location, as long as it's not in one of these prohibited sites, which means that you could do a two unit project on that site, you could do a lot split on that site, or you could do a two unit project and a lot split on that site. Next slide, Dave. Um, so what does that look like? You can see right here, you have an existing home. 
Um, it's an existing lot, one lot. We're going to do a two unit project. Uh, next slide, if you can click. Dave, you just add, you either add a build two lot, uh, excuse me, you either build two units there if it was vacant before, or you add a second unit to that existing lot, and uh, it has to be a minimum of eight. The city can, cannot prohibit it from being smaller than 800 square feet. Um, and the question is, is an ADU also allowed? That is unclear in the law. Uh, next slide, please, Dave. And what we got? And I guess it's, it's equally unclear whether it's attached or detached, right? Correct. Okay. Um, and you'd be required to, you know, the four foot rear and side, uh, rear and side setbacks would be allowed, but. Um, uh, the city couldn't require setbacks of greater than that district. And you could require one additional parking spot um, for that unit, um, as long as, in Pinole, as long as there wasn't a car share vehicle within uh, another location, within one block, excuse me. Next slide, please. So uh, another thing would be same situation, but you do a lot split. So you'd have to split the lot 50-50 or no less than 40-60. Um, and on your front lot, you have, uh, Dave, if you could click um, the, yes, if you could uh, click forward again. Yeah, perfect. So you can see here, you either build um, on each one of the lots, you could possibly build two units or you could just build one unit on each lot. So same situation, but essentially you could double the amount of units you have. Um, next slide, please. Uh, but the one thing to point out is ADUs are explicitly prohibited in this situation. So you cannot have six lots where you used to have three. So those uh, graphics are um, not, might be a little confusing. I forgot it's sort of hard to go through those animations where you're not, <laughs> not the one controlling it. But so housing units on the existing lot, if you have an existing lot, you could either do two uh, units on that lot or if they're brand new and there's nothing there, if you have an existing unit, you could add another one for two units nor no short-term rentals are allowed. There's no owner occupancy requirement allowed. Um, and it's unclear whether ADUs are allowed. Now, if you do a lot split, um, you could put two new units on each one of those lots. Um, if there was already a lot, excuse me, if there's already a unit on one of the lots, you could only add one more. ADUs are prohibited and there's a requirement for the owner uh, occupancy affidavit. If you did housing units and lot splits, you could, you know, as it says, be up to four, four units total on the combined between the two lots. Next slide, please. So on that last example, there, there, you can't do a junior ADU then along with that ADU. Is there Correct. Right? So okay. the, the most you could get to is, is four units. Mm -hmm. um, uh, under by doing both the lot split and putting two units on both okay. uh, properties. Next slide. So um, we talked about this before. What an objective standard means. So I'll skip that slide. Uh, next slide, please, Dave. So um, the town has the ability. The city has the ability to adopt objective standards as long as they don't prohibit something that is uh, smaller than 800 square feet. They have to, and, you know, that would allow up to two units of 800 square feet. Um, that is something a town could do as explicitly as prohibiting units greater than 800 square feet. That's something that some uh, locations are thinking about doing. Um, and that raises a question of what projects become economically feasible. Um, you know, for example, if you did a lot split and you tried to sell off that um, lot, how much is someone going to pay for that lot if all they can build there is an 800 square foot unit? Um, 
Now that may not be a consideration for you if you, you know, own your property for 30 years and you bought it for not very much and it's all paid off. But the point of this is it, it would, you know, sort of discourages uh, sort of speculation of going in and paying a lot of money for a property that you think you can split into two and sell off one of the lots when uh, the value of that second lot might not be that great if all you can build there is an 800 square foot home. Um, so some agencies are thinking about um, adopting objective design standards before the law goes into effect on January 1st. Um, this is something we've uh, alerted uh, the same manager to, and I think it, it's um, gonna be discussed by the council at the next uh, council meeting about, you know, whether it's something they want to add to a future agenda item. What I would say is um, just the point of caution. Well, we're, we're talking about it in a little bit, so I'll, I'll wait until that. Next, next slide, please. So. Also, I have a question on that last slide. Yeah. Um, the 800 square foot designation um, is that interpreted as a footprint or just a, a, stri a straight area requirement? Because I could do a two-story, uh, two two-story buildings with a 400 square foot footprint. Right, it, that, it that is, gets into height and bulk things. You know? Yes, um, it it does not. Um, it just says 800 square foot it, uh, thing. It doesn't differentiate floor area and, and bulk in that way. Um, uh, I would think, in general, many um, jurisdictions are, you know, would want to prohibit, have been imposing height limits that sort of force that to be a flat 800 square feet um, on the on the ground, sort of all on one floor. Is that something that would be handled through an objective standard? Yeah, we would adopt an objective standard. So if the city doesn't adopt any specific SB nine objective standards. Any of the existing objective standards that we have for single family homes would you know still apply. There there aren't necessarily a ton of those. Um, they would excuse me, they would apply to the extent, extent they're not otherwise preempted by uh, SB9. Um, there aren't a ton of those, but there are there are some. Um, but you know, some areas are thinking about more adopting more objective standards similar to how more objective standards were adopted for uh, ADUs specifically. Um, next slide please. Um, so SB9 regulates the city but it doesn't preempt HOA rules or CCNRs or anything like that. So if a you know, a subdivision has CCNRs or there's an HOA that prevents this type of thing, these types of units, those are still enforceable by the um, HOA or, or by, you know, the neighborhood association, they can still enforce those rules. Um, and the scope of the law may be, you know, when you hear about the law, it's quite a big change. It certainly is a pretty dramatic change and restriction on local authority. Um, but in practice, it's yet to be seen how widely the law will be um, imposed, not imposed, but, you know, actually utilized. Uh, the Turner Center, which is sort of a housing think tank at UC Berkeley, has done put out a report, and they estimated that really only 1% of the lots in um, the state would could even take advantage of this law because of sort of physical restraints or financial um, restraints based on the parcel. So you could imagine, for example, a parcel in Pinole where there's an existing single family home and there's not a, um, a huge backyard. You know, if you have a 5,000 square foot lot and you have a normal single family home on it, uh, there may not be the space to really subdivide there and build, you know, there's not the space there to put four units. That just doesn't exist. Um, there may be the space to put one unit there on the back, 
but you could already realistically do that as an ADU now, so there's not really that big of a difference necessarily between doing it as an ADU and doing it as a um, uh, as a SB9 unit. Um, and so there are, uh, the scope of the law may be limited. Now, it doesn't mean this law can never be taken advantage of, um, and certainly if it's the law next to where you live that happens to be large enough and uh, have the right layout to build four units there, you know, that's a big change. Uh, I just say this by way of mentioning, I, you know, I would not expect that a huge number of these projects would occur in Pinal, um, and, you know, over the next uh, few years, you know, I think the experience with ADUs has been, um, instructive that there certainly are ADU applications in the city. I don't want to say there are none, but it's not like the city has been inundated with, you know, hundreds and hundreds of ADU applications. Um, and so I think similarly, we wouldn't expect to right off the bat on January 1st be, you know, swamped with applications for this type of project. Next slide. Please, so I can stop here for questions about SB9 before we move on to um, talk briefly about uh, the two other bills. Okay, does anyone have any questions? I have one brief question about one of the earlier slides, uh, prohibited locations. It says slide 10 on the packet, but it's probably a different number in this because I noticed the pagination is different. Right after high fire hazard severity zone, there's the other prohibited location slide. And I don't know if we can go back to that or not, but it says other prohibited locations and then land subject to, and then I'm not sure whether that's, there's supposed to be something else there or whether it's just, yeah, that bit. Oh, it's, yes, it should say a uh, land subject to conservation easement. Uh, okay. All right, that will oh, go. Okay. Move, but not all of it. That was my question. That's it. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I do. I, I have a couple of quick questions. Um, one, I found it very interesting about how uh, SB9, um, that there's ways around SB9, and one of them is within a designated historic district. Now, we were toying with the idea, and not really sure how far we got about having the old town historic district. Uh, uh, be, you know, to be designated as a historic district. I'm not really sure where we stand on that, but uh, is that something we can do to kind of limit SB9 projects if we so desire? Um, yeah, so to answer the first half of the question, which I, I think Commissioner Moriarty was going to ask about later in the evening, uh, the plan is for the revised, uh, there were design guidelines uh, that a subcommittee was looking at. Uh, the plan is for those to go out to the subcommittee to take a final comment on is sometimes in, sometime in December for it all to go back to the council in the new year. Um, but what that was was a historic, just sort of a simple overlay in which uh, additional design guidelines applied. It was not a formal historic preservation uh, historic district and you know there had been direction from the council and, and other uh, area you know the, not the rules committee the, the municipal code update subcommittee that you know this was really in, that ordinance was really intended to be as less and least invasive as possible and while um, certainly you know creating a historic uh, district or you know, lane markings or buildings would prevent SB9 projects on those properties. It also comes with all these other uh, restrictions on projects and, you know, seek what implications whenever you want to do a project. Um, you know, it would potentially prohibit, you know, for example, if a, a SB9 historic, if we made uh, Old Tampanol, a historic district, it would potentially prohibit some of, you know, the outdoor dining area that East Bay Coffee has might not, you know, be allowed in a historic district um, or may need to do certain things to comply with that. So um, that was a long way of saying 
yes, if the city created a historic district, and within that historic district, SB9 projects could be prohibited by the city, but the overlay that is um, being considered by the city would not be a historic, would not create a historic district. It would just create an area where certain design guidelines are required to be followed. Okay, and my second comment or question observation is that I think it's interesting how SB9 regulates local agency authority and does not preempt CCNRs or HOA rules. And my take on that is that, you know, when I think of HOAs, I think of gated communities, I think of people with wealth. It almost seems like um, including that in the law to, pre, you know, not to preempt HOA rules would allow a gated district to just. Well, well this, uh, and uh, Commissioner, you, um, froze there, but the, the purpose of that, I, you know, the law doesn't say that explicitly. I was simply pointing out because the legislature has preempted, or maybe I'm frozen, everyone's frozen. Oh, now I can see Commissioner Moore already. Uh, okay, you're there. <laughs> Are we though, is everyone else frozen? The new year has started. No, there's David Hannum. Yeah. He's all right. I wonder if there was a power outage. I wonder if there was a power outage. That's a real good point because now everyone's gone. I somehow, because I had Wi-Fi problem, I, I was with 5G and I'm, I'm still on. Ah, wow. Yay, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes not even Wi-Fi is not bad. Uh, I wonder if that's future. Uh, I don't think it will be up yet, but I bet that's what happened. Oh. Yeah. Wait, Jeff. <laughs> something with the weather. Something. Well, I don't know if we have a quorum to end the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's different there i've never had that happen yeah now i just want to remind everybody that we're still recording the meeting now so right now there's only uh myself and you and that's the commissioner here yeah and i don't know where alex went alex just are you still there, Alex? We just lost him too. Huh. And I am right now checking PGID to see if there's any outage. Right. And now I'm, st I'm still good, so. <laughs> yeah. And I know for the fact that my uh, my internet it, it, it's 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 like fluctuating for the for the entire night anyway. So. Uh, I haven't been outside. Is it windy outside? It is really a very stormy outside. You know, when I was talking, I was literally sitting in my car for the people who, who, who were here in the background because, you know, my Wi Fi is just not getting anything and my 5Gs is not getting anything. You know, so I had to step outside. Well, Frank is back. Yes, I apologize. My internet dropped for the, the home we, internet. We think everybody's dropped, Frankie. <laughs> okay. Everybody went yeah. away. No, everybody went away except for Simon, me, and David Hannum, and maybe David Snell. You were there, right? Yep. Okay. Yes, we're here. So I'm, I'm using my Wi Fi off my phone. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's exactly what happened because I, I have early on Wi Fi issues, so I turn on my phone anyway. So. Uh... And, and we lost Alex. So we lost presentation. <laughs> I, I, I'm I guess it's the presentation uh, on from the next part, but <laughs> yeah, majority of us are using Comcast, and we're, maybe that's the reason why. I mean, I know that Dave is using what uh, Comcast, so uh, it, that might be the case. Yeah. So, question: Do we give Do we give it five minutes, and then um, we have to continue call? the meeting if we are if we are not getting anybody joining back? Uh, actually, Adam is back, so so we have a call right now. I think we have four people. No, we need one more. 
Who else? We've got. Oh, Alex. No, you got four. Set, you got right? four. I'm sorry. Yeah, you got so four. So now we do. Okay. We just don't have Alex. <laughs> We're having problems with Comcast as well. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, Comcast issues here. Right. Um, unfortunate. Uh, but it might be here. Uh, you know. Uh, you know, to do 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 uh David and I mean and we do have a call me. We do uh, yeah, I just yeah, I just dropped all of a sudden, but I'm back on through my cellular, which is not great. Yeah, no, yeah, and uh, same thing here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We lost so, podcast too, so let's just give it another what time is it? Nine forty seven? Yeah. Yeah, let's and Raphael just joined. Let's give it Raphael until... just joined, so we have five people now. Oh, looks yeah. like there was a local network failure. I'm connecting. Yeah, the yeah. you're using Comcast also, right? Maria? Yeah, Comcast. Yeah. We have Comcast, so, yeah, all the people who have Comcast has issues right now. Right now. <laughs> so what we could do, David, is we could um, we could move on to the 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 rest of the agenda. Um, right. And just go to the the commission's report. Although with everybody, you know, I don't know if it makes sense to do that or if it makes sense to just. This Dave Snell, if I may, I hate to interrupt. We are not broadcasting on Comcast at the moment, so we're not broadcasting. I would need some be power and restart some things down here. So the public can't participate either. No. The public via Comcast viewership. The public via Comcast viewership, which we don't know how many it is. Um, so we should probably not continue discussing at least until we're back on the air or any of the meeting items, right? Because then we'd be, you know, I'm right. looking at yeah. uh, the suggestion here is to uh, is to continue this meeting to the next time, finishing finishing up the rest of the business for time. That's my thought. That's that's we can do that. That's not you have you have the people here to do that. So uh, you, or you have a quorum. We um, and we have the vice chair sitting in for the chair, yeah. uh, and so we can if you want. You can adjourn the meeting right now. Uh, continue or continue the item. Uh, continue Alex's item, and maybe maybe do a full another another scope of it, um, or at least do um, maybe the last so, probably a little bit of SB nine, and then we can only bring that back at the next meeting. Yeah, for, for the vice chair, I think uh, we are at the end of SB nine. We were planning to do SB ten, yeah. so I suggest yeah, that we can just. Minutes. Exactly, and then we can we, we can do SV10 on the next meeting, and then you know uh, follow up with uh, you know with all the uh, you know, commissioner you know questions. I guess. I, I think that's that seems to be a reasonable thing. We're at nine fifty right now. It's been a short time. If anybody could get back on um, via phone, they would have done it by now, like Frankie and Raphael. Yeah. So, yeah. It's a call in person within the, the group here. Can you identify yourself? Is it Justin? I just see a call in user. I can't identify them. Okay. Well, I got a phone call right now. Hold on a second. Community Development State. Hey. Hi there. Can you hear me now? Yes. Call in user. We can hear you. Great, this is Lily Whalen. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't think you can hear me. Right now, okay. Yes, we can hear you, Lily. Okay, well, that's good. Read up. Okay. Okay. So, before we come to okay, a consensus. I'll recommend that to Dave right now, on day end. Okay, cool. All right, thanks. Yeah. Hang on, uh, hang on. Yeah, that, that was Alex. <laughs> And he basically recommended that we we can be in the meeting right now, and yeah. uh, and that we continue the items to the next meeting. So that's then we're all of one accord. So we need a motion and a second. 
I'm making a motion of continuing the uh, you know current meeting uh, to the next time uh, in discussions for the uh, new business second item uh, to be focusing on SB10. Uh, yeah, so okay. that that would be my motion. Do we have a second motion? Um, second. Okay. Thank you. I would. Okay. And then let's just do a roll call of them. David Hannum. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Menes. Nay, I prefer the entire meeting be continued, not just one item. Well, I mean, the rest of the items are, are normal agenda items that are on an agenda. So this is really the only agenda. This is the only item with any action to it. So. Okay. Uh, because from the way the motion was worded, it sounded to me like we were continuing that item and nothing else. Yeah, that's that's, that's correct. That, that's correct. Because so the rest we're done with that item at the continued meeting, what happens to the other items on the agenda? The other, like, um, through, through the vice chair, the other items are actually always on uh, our you know regular meeting, so it will be continued right. anyway. Okay, yeah. so the other items will continue, but I change my vote to yes. Okay. Um, Commissioner Martinez? Yes. Commissioner Benzuli? Commissioner Benzuli? Okay, he's frozen. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Wong? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Kern is crossed out. Uh, Vice Chair Moriarty? Yes. And Chair Ben Willis has been hexed out. So we do, we have a motion. Right, I keep here. dropping in here now. Okay. There he is. Adam, Adam do you vote you yes on Adam? the continuing of the motion? Oh, I, I, I miss, I'm missing half of this. I keep getting dropped out of the whole thing. But I say we stop. Okay. I can't, I can't log in. That's a yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. 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 So motion, yes. motion carries 5-0. <laughs> uh to adjourn the meeting and to continue item uh continue item g2 on the section regarding uh sb10 and uh we're good to go okay thank you very much thank you all right we'll see you tonight Tara, see you all next right. week <laughs> next week thank you for the thank you, thank you. Bye.